from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is August 13th, uh, 2013. This is David Klein speaking. Uh, I am a professor of history at Virginia Tech, also working for the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress to for the Civil Rights History Project. Today we are uh, interviewing Judge DeArmy Bailey here in Memphis, Tennessee. And behind the camera is John Bishop of UCLA and Media Generation. And we will begin now. Um, thank you so much for being part of this project. Judge I'm Bailey. honored uh, for the opportunity. Great. So as I started to say off camera, that I wanted to start with a couple of questions um, before we get into, the, into the really your, your life story and your story in the movement. And, and if I could, the first question is, to you, what is the difference between uh, an activist and a radical? An activist uh, is a person who uh, devotes energies to uh, making change, uh, to uh, some project or some issue that that person is uh, dedicated to. Uh, a radical uh, is a person who's also d devoted uh, in terms of their energies to making change, but they're not uh, uh, bound by the same um, parameters mm -hmm. that an activist is. A radical uh, sees beyond the um, uh, acceptable barriers uh, for action and conversation and, and bangs against the outer walls to uh, make progress much farther than uh, than is institutionally uh, mm -hmm. conceived. Uh, now, being a realist, uh, <laughs> even though you're doing that and you're trying to open new horizons beyond acceptable boundaries, the end result is that you, you're lucky if you get to those walls. Mm -hmm. But uh, the activist, I think, short sells himself or herself by accepting the, the boundaries, and therefore, because you're never going to achieve everything that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. And so... The radical, we posit concepts and, and agendas uh, for change that in reality we don't expect to achieve. Mm. But we're dedicated to it. We fight for it as if we believe that we will. And that's mm -hmm. what keeps us going and makes dramatic change. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you probably appreciate why I, why I started asking you that question, especially because of the, the subtitle of your autobiography. And I think... I mean, do you think of yourselves in those terms, uh, in terms of being both an activist and a radical, or different things at different times, or, or a radical? Well, actually, I generally eschew labels. Mm -hmm. uh, we use that label for the book, The Education of a Black Radical. And when I was in politics in California, uh, I and the other two uh, of my colleagues who were elected to the council were dubbed by the media as being radicals, and it was called the radical takeover of the Berkeley city government. And so uh, I've had that label attached to me. I have I never used that myself okay. in, in terms of definition when I was out there, and I really don't use it much today, mm -hmm. uh, but I do accept that that's a fair definition of me and my politics. The reason I don't like labels is simply because it, pigeon, it makes you more easily pigeonholed, and therefore you're much easier target for those who want to discount what you're trying to do by hit, attaching you with label. But that, when I was involved in civil rights in Baton Rouge, uh, my friends were in core, the Congress of Racial mm -hmm. Equality, and they were big supporters of what we were doing. But I, it took me the longest of time before I was willing to join core because mm -hmm. I just don't personally like to associate myself with identifiable groups where I can then be limited in terms of how people perceive me or what I can do. Right, right. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, and then the other big question I want to ask before we get into the biography is, how do you define the civil rights movement? I mean, our, our project here is called the Civil Rights History Project. And there, there's a sort of traditional take on what the civil rights movement is, which is often um, bounded by uh, or focused on, on Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, but I was very struck at the, um, the National Civil Rights Museum um, that you were a founder of that the story, you begin the story much earlier, basically starting with the story of slavery and coming up to the very present day. 
um, I'm interested in what, how you see the movement as a, is it a much longer um, uh, battle on many fronts uh, than we sometimes see in the history books as the 1955 to 1968? Well, the earlier context, going back to slavery and mm -hmm. the abolitionist movement, uh, I, I can't really claim a great deal of credit for envisioning that as a, uh, as a preliminary to the larger exhibits at the museum. Uh, that was a broad context that was created uh, in collaboration with uh, some very excellent designers, including mm -hmm. Ben Lawless, who had helped us to lay out much of the plan. Uh, but I brought to the creation of the museum uh, my experience in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, we had bought the Lorraine at a foreclosure auction. I knew that it was a place that people would come from around the world because that's where Dr. King's blood still can be seen on the concrete walkway uh, outside of the room where he last slept. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, so to me it was a way of taking the magnetism of the death of King, but not creating a museum about King. Mm -hmm. And so the museum that I wanted to create, and, 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 and it was in large part the, the sense of, of my own experiences in the movement that, that helped to set the path for what the museum was to be because having come as a young college student in 1960 to the beginnings of the sit-in movement mm -hmm. uh, in Baton Rouge and then having uh, traveled down to Atlanta and visited with the SNCC leaders and been out into uh, Ruleville and, and sat down with Fannie Lou Hamer on our front porch and, and been at uh, some of the great marches and dramatic scenes over in Bogalusa where the okay. Deacons for Defense and Justice had to meet us and escort us uh, into town and protect us while we were there. I knew the intensity of that movement and I also knew that the civil rights movement was not king. It was mm -hmm. not any singular leader, even such a great person as a James Farmer, or, mm -hmm. uh, who was equally very much important to that struggle. Um, but rather it, were, it, it was the combination of individuals, those young students that I saw uh, who inspired me as another student who were willing to uh, put their education on the line, to go to jail, to uh, have their families worry about them, in some cases uh, their economic uh, security being threatened, their family's okay. security because their students were involved. And I saw the courage mm -hmm. of these people, and, I, and, and as I would go to these rallies and participate in them and hear the music, that's why we mm -hmm. have an exhibit about the mu music of the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement, the SNCC Freedom Singers, and mm -hmm. of course you know Fannie Lou Hamer was a very great singer at these mm -hmm. meetings. I've heard her sing, mm -hmm. and um, uh, Guy Carawan and Pete Seeger. Yep. And so uh, all of that was a part of the spirit, uh, mm -hmm. even Ann Fagan, uh, uh, Ann Braden rather, mm -hmm. uh, and Carl Braden. Well, Ann Braden I came to meet when I was uh, thrown out of school at Southern, and she was uh, editing the Southern Patriot newspaper oh, out of okay. Kentucky. And yeah. she, she would send us words of encouragement and, and a few dollars here to help us. Uh, so it was a whole broad range of people mm -hmm. that I saw. Will Campbell up in mm -hmm. uh, from Mount Juliet who recently passed who uh, was a mentor to me uh, in he helping away. to understand uh, uh, the spirit of, of human struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a, a, uh, about three weeks uh, at the University of Wisconsin in 1961 uh, at a Southern Student Human Relations Seminar where there were 18 students, half black and half white, sponsored by the National Student Association, and we were studying uh, race issues, mm -hmm. and we were bringing in speakers, uh, and Will Campbell and Connie Curry were the two leaders of that of those sessions for us, mm -hmm. and we got to know each other. Uh, Bob Zellner, for example, who uh, later became a leader in SNCC, was mm -hmm. one of my members of that uh, uh, group there at the uh, right. University of Wisconsin. So uh, it was the process of learning, of studying, of being on the scenes. And so to me, the civil rights movement was the, uh, was the cauldron uh, within which you had this extraordinary mix of spirit, of courage, of people from different backgrounds, and most importantly, uh, young blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the first generation uh, from our families that went to college. Mm -hmm. And we didn't go off to college at these black state universities in the South with the intention of creating a civil rights movement. 
uh, it was completely accidental that the movement happened in my uh, first year of college and that I became exposed to it. Mm. Uh, we went off to have a good time to, to educate ourselves for uh, better opportunities in the, uh, in the world of, of business and, and, and growth. But we, we were aware, and, and so I guess I'll also have to look back a little bit in terms of the definition of the movement because it was not just what happened in 1960 with the students at Greensboro, but I would remember as a young teenager sitting in a drugstore where I delivered uh, um, ice cream and things to people in the neighborhood on my bicycle who would order it at the store. Uh, but when I wasn't working there, I would sit and look at the magazine rack where we had Jet Magazine and uh, Ebony and mm -hmm. uh, black newspapers from Detroit and Atlanta Daily World. And, uh, and I would read about the Civil Rights Movement. And I saw the picture of Emmett Till when he'd been killed and his, his uh, bloated body was uh, exhibited in the cask and I, uh, and, and being in Memphis, which was so close to these hot spots of Mississippi, I saw those kids over in uh, Little Rock at Central High School mm -hmm. and the courage that they showed. And these were kids my age. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, my civil rights movement, it, it, not as I define it, but as it defined me, mm -hmm. uh, was a movement that started probably in the 1950s with uh, the killing of Emmett Till, uh, with the students at Central High School in Little Rock, with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in a somewhat more distant way, the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, and so when, when we were setting about to build the museum, the primary story, and that's why the exhibits there, the primary exhibits in the museum start with the uh, Central High School desegregation. Well, it starts with Brown versus okay. Topeka, yeah, uh, yeah. with the lodge exhibits there, because uh, the 54 decision was a pivotal one. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that the 54 decision uh, was the fuel that ignited uh, the spirit of black America. I think that, that seeing Emmett Till's body mm. and seeing those black kids now, of course, that came as a result of the 54 decision, but it was the hard work, the groundwork that had been done by Daisy Bates with the right. NAACP there in Little Rock, uh, who had the courage to help those kids to go to school, the courage of all of this movement. And so, Do, do you remember me, your actual reaction to that, to the Emma Till photograph, or, I mean, your reaction, but also other people in the community? Quiet shock. Uh, I can't say that I was completely surprised, uh, nor was I uh, overtaken with strong emotion about uh, this because it was an education. It was a wake-up call, more than a than a shock. I guess mm -hmm. it was a wake-up call that that we've got some hell of a struggle ahead of us here if this is what they'll do to, to, to these young kids, to, mm -hmm. to my people, to me, mm -hmm. uh, that this is serious business. And so it, it, it matured me very quickly, uh, as did what I saw those kids at uh, uh, Central High School mm -hmm. do and go through. Uh, it made quick men and women uh, strong, and, and it began to prepare us uh, for uh, what lay ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you were young people, it's happening to young people. Yes. Right, right. And, we, and, and it was no uh, platitude to say it could happen to me. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I would get on the bus and, and when I was going to Southern and uh, I'd take the train from Memphis to uh, Hammond, Louisiana. Um, and get off there, and then I'd have to take a bus from Hammond over to Baton Rouge. And, and I would sometimes be sitting in the front section of the bus because I knew that the law was that they couldn't segregate me, but I'd be the only black sitting up there in the front. And then as the bus stopped in these little small towns, and this was in 1960, 1961, mm -hmm. whites would get on, and they would refuse to take the seats behind me, and so they'd be standing in the aisles. Right. And I would just be there in the seat and pretend that I was sleeping and just turn and going about my business. But, because but that I, was an interstate bus. So that interstate was the, bus. Right, and, that was and the, yeah. Because they would have signs in the bus stations that said uh, uh, whites, uh, white women, white men, and colored. And, and the white sign actually would say whites uh, and interstate passengers. But they'd also have um, uh, 
signs that said colored, mm -hmm. and of course they didn't differentiate between colored men and colored women. Mm -hmm. And so even though by law, since I was traveling from one state to the other, they couldn't segregate me, but in reality, uh, uh, you were in quite some danger if you, and, and I would even go on the buses from uh, Baton Rouge to Atlanta, mm. uh, at sometimes alone. And why I did that and, and where I had the courage to do that, uh, because I could have easily uh, ended up missing. Mm. Um, but uh, maybe I was just crazy like that, I don't know. Uh, but I, uh, I just felt that uh, uh, I, I was not born to lead my life, letting fear mm. overcome my dignity. Mm. It wasn't that I wasn't afraid, but it was the question of which would win out. Mm. And so as I would go to, into these places, uh, I was shaking in my boots as it goes, <laughs> but they didn't know it. <laughs> right, right, right. Couldn't let them see that. But, yeah. yeah. W would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about your, your mother and father and the influence? Oh, I should have. I'll uh, have a little time to say. So we, have, we have to close the file, otherwise it gets bigger and bigger, and if we anything happens, we lose it all. <laughs> sure. So um, we're going again. Okay. So if I could ask you to, to tell us a little bit about your your parents and their maybe their influence in, in this regard, and I I know um, a little bit about um, what they did for work, and uh, that th there's a story there as well. I think about. Uh, independent African Americans and the tradition of the Pullman Porters, for example. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, it was a struggle for both my mother and father, neither of whom finished high school. Mm -hmm. They got married uh, while uh, they were both in high school, and so uh, my daddy went to work with his father, who was doing uh, building and repairing houses, and uh, my grandfather was sort of an entrepreneur, after whom I'm named. Mm. Is and that in Tennessee? Yes, yeah. uh, although he was born in Mississippi, uh, near uh, Shelby County, up uh, near the Tennessee line, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I was growing up, uh, my mother was, uh, 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 my earliest work that I remember her doing was as a housekeeper at a medical clinic mm -hmm. uh, with a doctor's office. And, and they treated her very well. I mean, they, um, they treated her with respect. Uh, she would even... Um, double as a receptionist at the clinic, um, although the, these were white doctors and their, and their clientele was white. Mm -hmm. But she was basically a maid, but she was respected and she carried herself with dignity uh, when she was there at the, uh, at the clinic. Uh, and she worked with Dr. Segerson, E.C. Segerson was the physician. And I remember that um, uh, following her work at the um, uh, clinic, uh, and we would go visit my brother and I sometimes, and and we were, again, we were treated uh, with respect. Uh, my grandfather, in addition to the work that he did in his own business, pardon me, uh, he, uh, my grandfather, Papa as we called him, mm -hmm. uh, would um, work for two white women, uh, sisters, who were wealthy and uh, they let him plant uh, cotton on the back field of their yard, hmm. as well as peanuts. Hmm. And, uh, and so, again, they treated Papa with a great deal of respect. And so my early experience, both in terms of my mother, my grandfather, uh, my father, as I said, was working with my grandfather in those early years. Um, following uh, the early work with, with his father, he started working for the railroad here in Memphis. He worked as a uh, mail handler, so mm. he would unload the mail from the trains uh, onto cots at the station and okay. uh, was able to initially get uh, promoted up to work as a train porter, mm -hmm. first part-time, and then uh, he got a full-time position with the uh, Illinois Central Railroad. And Daddy worked the line from um, New Orleans to Chicago. And so uh, he'd get on the train here in Memphis and then he'd go to Chicago and then back to uh, New Orleans and then come back and get off here at Memphis. And as a result of him working with the railroad, uh, we could travel free, my brother mm. and I and my mother and, of course, my, my daddy. And so uh, he would take my brother and me to football, uh, to, well, not football, to baseball games. Mm. Oh, we'd, yeah. we'd go to St. Louis uh, and uh, Chicago and Detroit. 
Um, he'd take us over to, to St. Louis, and I saw some of the early black stars, Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb. We were just kids. We stayed in a little black hotel there in St. Louis. Um, um, my mother uh, always respected the uh, maturity of my brother Walter and me, and uh, so we had some latitude in terms of uh, what we could do as young people. We, we could go out at night and, and uh, party and uh, late and borrow my daddy's car and, uh, because uh, we acted responsibly. Mm. Uh, we, um, she knew that both my brother and, and uh, I were uh, working with some black political people here uh, doing political campaigns in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, even as we were early on in college, mm -hmm. and so there was no criticism of that. And were they involved at all, your parents, or were they just supportive of your of your work activity? No, they they were not uh, politically. Uh, I mean, they were they were voters, mm -hmm. but they were not organizationally active. Mm -hmm. So um, now my mother was. Uh, uh, she went back to uh, school and got her GED, and. Um, uh, then she got licensed as a um, uh, as a barber, mm -hmm. and so she was one of the first uh, black female barbers in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she did that for a short while. Uh, well, short while it was probably four or five years mm. at a barber shop in the center of the black neighborhood in South Memphis, Mississippi, and Walker, where we grew up. And uh, after uh, four or five years of cutting hair. Uh, she went back and got her license as a nurse and became a licensed practical nurse and worked first at, uh, uh, well, she was one of the first black uh, nurses at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital here in Memphis and uh, worked for many years, ultimately retiring from, uh, in nursing. But uh, hmm. um, my father, uh, he was, a, in addition to being a, um, a train porter, he was, a, he liked to, uh, play checkers and pool, so he mm -hmm. had a lot of friends. He was outgoing, um, very proud of his two sons, uh, but he was probably a bit more cautious, uh, mm -hmm. or savvy, I should say, uh, and therefore he didn't uh, particularly urge us to be shaking at trees or, mm -hmm. or rocking the boat. Uh, I remember that... Um, when we would go down to the train station to get on the train to go down to Baton Rouge, um, when you got to the uh, to go up onto the train, the conductor would ask you, uh, where were you going? And you'd say, uh, Baton Rouge or Hammond. And they'd say, to the left. Well, actually, uh, to the left was where the blacks were being sent, mm. and to the right was where the whites were being sent. So it didn't really matter where you were going. Right. Uh, but I would... Um, Sometimes if my father wasn't, wasn't there, I'd go to the right into the white section and sit down. But typically, if he was with me or my mother and I, then I wouldn't uh, get them too upset about about doing that. I, um, but they knew that, that uh, uh, Walter and I, Walter was a football player and, and a very good one, so uh, he was uh, with the jocks to some extent uh, mm -hmm. in the early years. He later decided in part because of the civil rights efforts that were going on and he had been put off campus when I was expelled from Southern because of my activities. And oh, really? They lodged him in a dormitory of married students, a number of whom were law students, and that's how he got interested in a career in law. But um, my mother was supportive when I was expelled from Southern mm -hmm. in my junior year and I called her and told her about it and she was very calm. She mm -hmm. took things calmly. Mm -hmm. And my father uh, did as well. He was very supportive. But I guess it was the calmness and the um, uh, serenity and and uh, elegance, mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, quiet of my mother, and the strength of my father. And the, but but, uh, but she really kind of nurtured, I think, in in her own way, not by advocacy, but by supporting us, uh, the sense of independence that, that I developed hmm. and that my brother developed. Mm -hmm. 
And even before you went to Southern, you were involved in, in some local organizations, right, with the NAACP and in Shelby County. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what those organizations were doing at that time? Uh, Memphis, uh, blacks would not have, did not have a big uh, challenge to vote in Memphis because mm -hmm. for many years in the uh, 1940s, uh, and into the 1950s, Memphis was run uh, by a political boss, one of the nation's oh. uh, premier bosses, Boss Crump. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Crump machine uh, controlled politics not only in Memphis but across the state of Tennessee. Part of his strength came from the black vote. And so Crump uh, would have certain uh, people that were his uh, uh, lieutenants in the Memphis black community uh, that would uh, help uh, corral and deliver the black vote for right. him. These lieutenants would in turn uh, be influential so that if black people needed a job or needed some contact, yeah. then they could go to these lieutenants. So the blacks were able to vote in Memphis uh, early on uh, mm -hmm. when the Crump machine uh, went into its uh, decline in the early 1950s and by the mid 50s uh, there was no longer a Crump machine, but you had a tradition of voting among blacks. Mm -hmm. Now, the NAACP was the premier uh, black political organization uh, during that time, composed of some black uh, uh, business owners uh, mm -hmm. and professionals, but also a lot of rank and file blacks were constituted the NAA. That was about the only really noticeable civil rights group here. There wasn't a SNCC or a CORE in sure. Memphis at the time. And the NAA was a little bit more cautious in its strategies than some of the groups that emerged in the uh, civil rights movement, uh, such as CORE and SNCC. And so to that extent, uh, the thrust of the NAACP was into the political arena, mm -hmm. uh, working with uh, a group of black Democrats that formed the Shelby County Democratic Club. Right. And that was the strongest uh, black political organization here uh, during the time that, that I was growing up as a teenager. And so my brother and I worked as volunteers uh, with the Democratic Club, uh, going to their meetings. Uh, we would go out on the sound trucks during the elections and, and uh, speak on the microphone and on the sound trucks and put out literature in the neighborhoods, urging uh, votes for white candidates that were not segregationists. In okay. those days, uh, we supported white candidates uh, primarily on the basis of whether they were for or against racial segregation. Right. And uh, these would have been liberals or moderates at the time. So the Democratic Club was very active in supporting right. those candidates and then uh, began to support uh, some uh, trailblazing black candidates. And so in the late 50s, uh, there were at least a couple of black candidates, uh, Dr. Walker, J.E. Walker, who ran for the mm -hmm. school board. He was one of the leading black businessmen. And uh, also Russell Sugarman, who ran for the Commission of Public Works. And that became sort of, those races, particularly the Sugarman race, became sort of cause celebrities because there was a good chance that Sugarman could have won, except that the uh, white community coalesced to force out some of the white candidates in order to focus their support around one who was Bill Ferris because there was no runoff and they were fearful that if they didn't do that, Sugarman would win. So hmm. that became kind of, I guess in a way, my first introduction to the politics uh, and also the politics of race. Right. And they were inextricably bound together uh, in the late 50s. And so Memphis the way of civil rights in the late 50s was more of a political mm -hmm. effort than it was uh, openly uh, race-based. Mm -hmm. uh, so by the time I came through high school here and left in 59 off to college, uh, Memphis was still sharply segregated. The amusement park, uh, we could only go to the amusement park on Tuesdays. Hmm. And if the Tuesday was a holiday, then we couldn't go. We'd have to wait until the following week because whites would go. The same thing with the city zoo. We'd go hmm. on Thursdays. And the schools were still segregated. Uh, the buses were segregated. So uh, right on to the end of the 1950s, Store, racism had yeah. not been tackled directly here in Memphis 
as it had began to be tackled in, right. say, uh, Montgomery with the bus boycott in 55 and 56 for the it, schools. Even those white candidates that you described the black community as... Perfect. Part two. <laughs> Part, Part two. three. So, so even those, um, even the white political candidates that the African American community did support, because they weren't strict segregationists, they weren't really dismantling the the system. No, in no, they case. were not. Yeah. Uh, 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 but that was dramatic uh, to have a, a, a commission candidate or to have a candidate for senate, which we did, and in fact, uh, he won. He served mm -hmm. only. A, short time, Ross Bass, a uh, Democrat, uh, uh, George Grider, who won a seat for Congress. Uh, and, and again, they, uh, they were uh, not pro-segregationists. They, mm -hmm. they were not pro in it. Well, they spoke in terms of the need for change. Okay. And uh, that was all we could expect. But, but basically, uh, they, they were not uh, 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 tilting at Dramatic change in the system of racism that we saw here, but those were, but it, but these were the baby steps that mm -hmm. were necessary, and and uh, they were important to us at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then and so that was what's uh, the Shelby County Democratic Club. Um, the NAACP was there a youth organization here in Memphis, or no, not no. at that time. Okay, uh, yeah. that's why my brother and I, who were who ordinarily in the in today's time would have mm. been. Uh, part of the youth organization, and I, and I think that there was it was good that there was no youth organization. I mean, they we were thrown in there with the uh, with the uh, with the seasoned uh, strategist, and we were in the meetings with them, and we were treated not mm -hmm. as uh, youth, but we were mm -hmm. uh, we were treated. In fact, uh, one summer, uh, I worked uh, uh, for the club. And the sheriff, Sheriff uh, Sheriff Hines, M. A. Hines, uh, who was a white sheriff here, um, uh, I got paid for doing my work with the club by the sheriff's office uh, because the club was supporting the sheriff, and <laughs> so um, so he hired me as a, um, and I don't know, I might have gotten forty dollars a week, which was a nice little stipend, and my job was to go out and find bootleggers. And let him know what uh, who was selling corn whiskey out in the county areas, and so um, <laughs> I'd go out to the bootleggers and buy a half pint of corn liquor whenever it was time for me to go get my check and take it down there and tell the sheriff they were still out there and give him my half pint of whiskey and get my check and keep on going. <laughs> but that was uh, support. That was how, hmm. you know. I mean, the, the, uh, that was the nature of the give and take of, of, of our relationships that, that helped us to get things done. So you had your eyes open to how politics <laughs> really work at a young age. Indeed I did. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. very interesting. And so then when you went on to, to college at Southern in, in Baton Rouge, you came down there as things were beginning to happen politically down there with, with some experience. Yes. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I ran for president of freshman class at Southern mm -hmm. and was elected, and uh, which was a uh, actually an interest, a good feat because I was now a stater. Most of the vast majority of the yeah. students at Southern were from Louisiana, and uh, our class was probably about uh, somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred students. Uh, so it gave me um, a, a forum, an opportunity to uh, speak out with the students and. And again, by the, at the beginning, when I was elected president of freshman class, uh, it wasn't a civil rights agenda, although uh, I was becoming aware of what was happening in South Africa because they had had the massacre in um, Johannesburg mm -hmm. with some black activists. And so I was beginning to at least sense not just the national thrust of change, yeah. But the international by the the drama of these people being massacred over there in South Africa. So, and I talked a little bit about that uh, on campus. I wrote a column <laughs> in the um, campus newspaper. I, I didn't do that until my second year uh, at Southern. But uh, I was beginning to emerge, I guess, as as a student leader mm -hmm. uh, on the campus, but not with any defined agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but just working with other students to uh, have nice parties. I brought in a band from Memphis, which was 
great for the people in Baton Rouge because they'd never seen a great rhythm and blues band mm -hmm. that I, like I brought in. They came in with their trailers. Uh, I mean, little, I don't mean these big trailers. I mean, trailers on the back of cars uh, yeah. of Gene Bowlegs Miller and just put on a hell of a show there. And uh, I brought Arthur Prysock to uh, uh, appear at one of our dances because Walt and I, we used to, when we were teenagers, I mentioned that my parents would, would tolerate us going out. We'd actually go to some of the adult, I mean, some of the clubs. mature clubs, nightclubs, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, drink whiskey and listen to the music. And, and, uh, but, but we would come back, and, and, and we would handle ourselves uh, responsibly. And so I was already introduced to the uh, entertainment circuit, and I just brought in some of those entertainers. Mm -hmm. uh, at least like that band anyway that I brought from Memphis and of course I didn't have any previous contact with Arthur Prysock but we brought him there as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't just political that I was engaged in when I was at Southern. I was just, as I said, a student leader having a good time and, and enjoying um, Louisiana. It was mm -hmm. a nice change for me, the environment, the students were at beautiful women. Southern had some of the most beautiful co-eds of, mm -hmm. of any college on the black college circuit. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they had a great band, uh, Southern University Band. So it was a great uh, experience for me in my first year there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what, was, what year was that? that you first 59. And 59, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and then, and then Greensboro happened. Um, yeah, that March. That, that, well, that, that February. That, yeah. That spring, right? Winter, spring. Yeah. And and I didn't know, but uh, within a month or two of that, some students from Southern went and got arrested, and uh, we didn't know that we mean in most of the students that they were planning to do this, mm. and uh, that was a real eye opener to us. Not just that they'd gone down there and been arrested, but then when they were uh, released on bond and got back to the campus, and the administration uh, chose to expel them from school. And this is this. They had sat. They sat. Can you tell us just a little bit about what they did? They sat in. Uh, yeah, they uh, went and sat in at some lunch counters mm -hmm. in downtown Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. and they were arrested mm -hmm. and charged with disturbing the peace. In fact, the first group of them that did that um, led to the first uh, U.S. Supreme Court decision, uh, Ghana versus the State of Louisiana, that affirmed the right of uh, demonstrators and and paved the way. Uh, for many of the subsequent demonstrators to uh, uh, proceed without being uh, prosecuted. And the basis of the Ghana case, Ghana versus Louisiana, was that these southern students had been arrested in downtown Baton Rouge, and uh, the state had accused them of disturbing the peace. Mm. And the Supreme Court decision uh, was that, and, and the theory of disturbing the peace was that they were peaceful. They went and sat at the lunch counters, but that they would stir other people, <laughs> white people up, who would attack them, right. and that was disturbing the peace. And the Supreme Court said in that decision, reversing the convictions because they were convicted at state level, mm -hmm. that you cannot be convicted of disturbing the peace because your peaceful conduct provoked someone else to engage right. in, in, in unlawful conduct against you. Fascinating. And so that was a pioneering case that came out right. of uh, the first year of demonstrations there at Southern. Amazing. Uh, well, some, yeah, you could charge someone with inciting a riot, I guess, by being peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, two Supreme Court decisions came out of uh, uh, two years later because the Ghana decision was rendered. Uh, the kids were arrested in uh, 1960, but the decision wasn't rendered until uh, 1961, which was pretty quick for the Supreme Court. Very quick. Uh, but that came out in, in the uh, autumn of 61. And so later that fall, the students at Southern started demonstrating again. And I was then part of a large demonstration of students that marched into downtown Baton Rouge um, in December of 1961. December 1961. <laughs> and we were uh, tear gassed and mm -hmm. dogs were set upon us. Uh, and some of our leaders were arrested. And one of our leaders who had been an organizer for the Congress of Racial Equality, uh, Reverend B. Elton Cox, uh, was arrested there that day. And uh, that led to a second Supreme Court decision uh, Cox versus Louisiana, in which uh, the Supreme Court reversed the Cox convi conviction. And they, they accused Reverend Cox uh, of violating a uh, Louisiana law that said that you couldn't uh, demonstrate at a courthouse, that it would be intimidation. And the Supreme Court actually went through some, it was a divided opinion of the court. Mm -hmm. um, and they 
ended up reversing the conviction by saying that, well, he actually had permission of the police. Well, I was standing next to Cox <laughs> when we marched, and I know that he didn't have permission of the police because uh, we got stopped twice. And the first time, the police officers told him, and I, my brother and I were right at the head of the line with Reverend Cox as we formed around the old state capitol in Baton Rouge and uh, we're getting ready to march and the police uh, captain came over and spoke to Reverend Cox and said, turn these students around. And he said, well, we came here to march and we're going to be peaceful. So we started out to march and they stopped him again and they said, now, uh, you've had your say and now I'm going to have mine. I want you to turn these students around. And Cox said, we, we're going to proceed to the jail. We're peaceful. And so he, they stopped him twice. Well, the Supreme Court took that as being that, they had, that he had gotten permission to carry on the demonstration at the courthouse. Mm -hmm. Well, it was really, a, 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 he was violating the order of the police, mm -hmm. what he was doing. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they let us go mm -hmm. on to the, because at that point they either could break us up and start arresting us or let us go on to the courthouse, uh, to the jail, because it was both a jail and courthouse. We were really going to the protest because our students were in jail down there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, but, the, uh, but the arrest was based on the fact that we were at a courthouse. Right, right. And that was a state law? Yeah. Yeah. And, so and many states that, had that. Right. And so that changed that. Well, that yes. That, well, that it case. changed it. It I don't know. It didn't really. The, the court danced around it because okay. because as judges themselves, mm -hmm. they didn't want to over <laughs> people on the court <laughs> on those steps. <laughs> so that's why they did this this flip flop about well, he had the permission, so it really wasn't a violation of the statute. Okay, so they didn't say well, so the statute. Was no, they left didn't unchallenged. overturn the statute. Oh, very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Because, of course, the courthouse is a, a potent symbol and a, a, a common place to demonstrate. Yes. Yeah. And the yeah. court wasn't, the, the, you could tell from the opinion, if you ever read Cox versus Louisiana, that, hmm. that they certainly didn't want to say that you could come at, on the courthouse steps and protest. Right, right. So, uh, so you were involved in, in those, um, those protests. And the result of, of, the, of your involvement in that was, was what at Southern? Well, um, by the time of my uh, uh, junior year, because the first wave of protests that happened in 1960 uh, upon the, um, in the wake of the Greensboro sit-ins did not yield any breakdown in segregation. The, the mm. restaurants continued segregated. Um, and things quieted down because the expulsion of the student leaders continued. Uh, that summer was really my first venture outside of the South where I was in an interracial setting when I went to the National Convention of the United States National Students Association as one of the two delegates from Southern. And uh, these were student leaders from around the country, black and white, including many from the South. And there was a great debate going on at that convention because the Southern schools were mad that the leadership of the National Student Association had endorsed the sit-in movement, mm -hmm. and they wanted to reverse that decision. And so the entire convention was, was uh, overwhelmed with the debate about whether to support the uh, sit-in movement, and, uh, which the convention ultimately did. But here I was hmm. uh, on this campus with some of the best student leaders, both conservative and, and liberal, uh, from across the country, arguing about the issue of the sit-in protest and, and about was, civil rights. This was where again? At the University of Minnesota, Minnesota. on the campus of the University of Minnesota. In the summer Minnesota. of 1960. The summer of 1960. Yeah. And that's where I got to uh, and, and meet uh, people like Alan Lowenstein and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Tom Hayton. Uh, Bonnie Frank was a student at Harvard at the time and one of the uh, outspoken supporters of the sit-in movement. Uh, fighting against the southern schools that wanted to reverse the endorsement. I mentioned that because not only was this my exposure to uh, white activists, uh, but it also uh, was, was um, uh, f for me anyway, the um, uh, pivotal um, chance to see that, uh, uh, that the student activism, you see, it was a whole different climate. Mm. Uh, at that time, not just black students now, mm -hmm. but white students. National Student Association 
was a strong national organization based in Philadelphia that had a budget, it had a lobbyist in, in Washington that was working to lobby Congress on issues that the students took positions on. Uh, Alec Lowenstein, who later went to Congress, was one of the sort of, he wasn't a student at the time, but he was very close to the students. And he was sort of one of the liaisons between the student association. So we had a national student group then. Yeah. Now the NSA also had its international wing that was called uh, uh, the, uh, well, it was the International Division, which later uh, was uh, associated in some kind of support from the CIA, and it was an embarrassment right. uh, to the NSA from that. But mm -hmm. the national section of the NSA uh, was not caught up in that. But I saw in my two years of, of conventions at, at the NSA um, some of the, again, some of the great issues and debates of the time. That was when HUAC, uh, uh, there was a big uh, debate about uh, the House Committee on Un-American Activities, uh, and they had had the demonstrations out there, and there was a film that was put out uh, by Fulton Lewis III that attempted to brand all of the activists uh, as communists. Uh, I can't remember this film now, but but they were going around the country uh, trying to persuade people that this was all a communist plot mm -hmm. among the students. And I saw a great debate uh, on the Wisconsin campus in the, in the summer of uh, 61, the following year, after I had done this seminar there. So I mentioned those things to say that by the time I was in my junior year at Southern, my horizon had expanded in terms mm -hmm. of, of understanding the national and even the international dimension, but particularly the national dimensions of this movement. And it was not just then confined to the energy of Southern black students, but it was confined to the supportive energy mm. of white students from different parts of the country. And so I could see a strong movement that, that I knew was there to last, and it did last. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, out of uh, NSA uh, came the um, um, Port uh, Huron meeting of mm -hmm. the students for Dem and the formation of the Students for Democratic Society. In fact, I have one of the original Port Huron statements among my papers. Um, and that was, of course, the statement by uh, the those who gathered at uh, Port Huron, Michigan, uh, to, to uh, give sort of their um, uh, treatise on uh, the things that needed to be changed in America. So, again, if you think in the context of what makes a radical? Mm -hmm. um, those who gathered at Port Huron and formed uh, the Students for Democratic Society. And again, I knew many of these people. Uh, I wasn't at Port Huron, but I was close enough to these people and their thinking and my associations with them, not just at, at uh, these conventions, but in later meetings because I would go back to uh, when I was in Massachusetts up to Yale and we would meet on the campus there, and student leaders would come from different parts of the North uh, together. But when I was in my junior year at Southern, um, protests broke out again by the time of that decision in, in the Cox case. Hmm. And Cox was arrested and prosecuted, and that was in December of 61. And the president closed the school, the president of the university, and uh, ordered everybody uh, home, for the ho home early for the holidays. When the school reopened, we still had a number of about uh, 20 of our students still in jail that had caused us to go down and protest to begin with. Mm. And so we started uh, a boycott on the um, campus because uh, we wanted to be assured that these students were not going to be expelled. And so we started uh, uh, rallies, and the administration asked us not to do that. And... Uh, they called me to the dean of men's office one night, my brother and me, and uh, the dean of men talked to me and told me that if I spoke at the rally that we had planned the next rally, that he was going to, that I was going to be expelled from the university. Mm. And so I spoke, and um, they called me to the dean of men's office uh, within a day or so, and uh, the dean of men and the dean of students uh, talked to me and gave me a letter uh, expelling me from the university. And simultaneous with the time that they had me in this meeting, the president of the university had called a, a campus-wide assembly of students in the gymnasium and announced that because of the ongoing uh, protests that he was going to close the school. 
and that okay. uh, uh, all students had to be off campus by 5 o'clock. This was a noon rally. And so you've got students there from all over the state of Louisiana who don't know how to get back home. They've sure. got to make accommodations. They've got to get money. They've got to contact their parents. And it was, it was hectic and, and, and very um, scary to, the, to many of these students. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know quite what was going on because, as I said, they had me in the dean of students' office. They handed me this letter, and it said uh, that my uh, connection with the university was being ended, and that it, they said I violated Rule 18. And uh, it was a rule in the university handbook that was entitled um, Lack of University Adjustment. And the rule read that uh, the university reserves the right to sever a student's connection for general inability to adjust to the patterns of the institution, period. And um, However they interpret that. Well, right. as I was told that this was a rule that they were using when students were homosexuals to, to expel, those, expel them. But most of the students who had been in the movement, you see, they were expelling them because they'd been arrested. Well, I hadn't been arrested at that time. And so the only rule that they could find that they could use to justify my expulsion was this Rule 18. And so, um, um, so with that expulsion, um, actually I did not leave campus that night. Uh, I, had a, uh, I stayed in my dorm because a lot of the students actually couldn't literally get off campus that mm. night, but the campus was on lockdown. And we uh, soon thereafter had to move off campus into a black hotel in downtown Baton Rouge and were mm. banned from coming to the university campus. Amazing. So that must have sown all sorts of, I mean, you talk about the chaos of everyone having to leave, but then that sows sort of recrimination, I would think, among the students, too. But, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and there was confusion, because when President Clark announced that the school was closing, he told the students, we don't know when the school is going to reopen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll send you, if, we, if, we, if you're to come back, we'll send you a letter. If you don't get a letter, don't come. And so it wasn't just then a matter of those students, because some other students, those who had been arrested, and a handful of other leaders were mm. explicitly told that they were expelled. But many students were not told that they were expelled. They just did not get a letter to come back to the university. It opened about two weeks after mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Clark Cole. I think it was about 10 days that he reopened the university. And um, in the meantime, we were trying to keep uh, the boycott going, trying to get, get kids, and, and three of us who had been expelled took a taxi from downtown back to the campus to uh, make a stand by attempting to register, uh, and the police quickly surrounded us on the campus, and fortunately for us, one of the university security put us in a car hmm. and drove us to the edge of campus as we were followed by Louisiana troopers, otherwise we'd have been arrested on the campus, but they mm. didn't want us to be arrested at that time, so they drove us off the campus. But that was how determined they were to quell any continuing mm. protest, and they did. They, they mm. killed the movement. Amazing. At least they killed it for, for a time. There, yeah, yeah. Now, how, how devoted were you to the concept of nonviolence in your protest there, and did you ever think about other, other options, other ways of protesting? We really, it really wasn't a choice. To me, the whole concept of nonviolence was, for, for us, really more of an academic issue. Because strategically, you didn't have much choice but to be nonviolent. I mean, if you're going into a lunch counter, or if, as we were, um, 3,000 of us marching from the campus to downtown Baton Rouge, and they've got police dogs and they've got tear gas, um, it didn't make any sense to be violent. How are you going to fight back with something like that? It's all you could do. I mean, so yes, we were strategically, uh, we were all well-dressed, mm. uh, orderly, mm. and even as we ran with the gas and with the dogs, we, we tried to maintain some decorum among ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would go, as I said, periodically down. In fact, I was, um, I was holed up in this black hotel in downtown Baton Rouge where we stayed for, oh, I'd guess three, four weeks. 
uh, trying to carry our movement on, and our bill was being paid by the National Office of Corps. And, uh, um, and, and so SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, one of the uh, leaders that had gotten us stirred up in this second wave of protest was a young man by the name of Dion Diamond, mm -hmm. who had come to Baton Rouge, but Dion was a SNCC organizer okay. that came to the southern campus. Now, there were organizers from New Orleans who had been with the Congress of Racial Equality who were also involved. Well, Dion was arrested quickly um, for his coming on the campus, speaking and raising hell. So... Because Dion was in jail, we were out of school. We were down at the Black Hotel. Uh, SNCC sent in to Baton Rouge two of its field secretaries, Chuck McDo and Bob Zellner. Okay, yeah. And, uh, well, Bob I had known from, we were both at the seminar at the University of Wisconsin the year before. And so uh, they came and checked in at the Lincoln Hotel where we were, and they were going to visit Dion at the jail. And they went to, uh, down to see Dion and they were arrested. They looked into Bob and Chuck's briefcase and found some literature and stuff and accused them of criminal anarchy and sedition and arrested them. Mm -hmm. And so because of that uh, involvement of the SNCC leaders, uh, I then started going to Atlanta uh, for some of the SNCC uh, staff meetings. Uh, and that's how I initially got to know uh, John Lewis and Julian Bond. Julian was editing the SNCC newsletter, The mm -hmm. Student Voice, and John was active in, in SNCC, and Jim Foreman was the national director. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, I went to a couple of the SNCC meetings in Atlanta from Baton Rouge, and some of the core people, Dave Dennis being one of them, who was a core field secretary who was staying with us at the hotel but hadn't been a student, they were suspicious of what I was doing going to Atlanta meeting with the SNCC people. Mm -hmm. And and I hadn't joined CORE. Uh, we created our own student organization called the um, uh, Student Action Committee, I think, mm -hmm. uh, because I just didn't want to be identified with a formal group. Mm -hmm. And so at one point they even looked at my mail that was coming from SNCC to see what kind of correspondence was going on. Now, I mention that as an aside only to suggest that there were some rivalries. Now, I wasn't part of those rivalries because there was nothing uh, sinister or one group plotting against the other, but mm -hmm. there was just that sort of group, I guess, uh, uh, self-protectiveness of turf, I guess, or whatever you want mm -hmm. to call it, and I was not a part of that. Uh, but by doing that, by uh, getting to know some of the SNCC people it expanded my base of contact with the movement mm -hmm. because by the time I left Southern and went to school in Massachusetts, uh, the Northern Student Movement, which was run by Peter Countryman, a young, a young white student up in Yale, uh, and had been formed by, by Peter and some of his people, Tom Gilhul and some others, um, it was based there. And so I would go over from Worcester to Yale to some of the NSM meetings. Well, because NSM was so closely allied as a support group in the North for SNCC, then the SNCC leaders would come up to the Yale campus for some meetings, and so I would go over to mm -hmm. New Haven. In fact, I started uh, a chapter of the Northern Student Movement in Worcester. Oh, you did? Yeah. And we started uh, tutoring and having some anti uh, discrimination demonstrations against some businesses in Worcester. Now, how did you end up at Clark? Uh, rather by circumstance or accident, I guess, after I was expelled from Southern, I was at the Lincoln Hotel. Um, we, we filed a lawsuit to try to get back in. We sued mm -hmm. in, in federal court with lawyers from CORE, a uh, law firm out of New Orleans, Collins, Douglas, and Eli, which is a black law firm uh, that was helping us. And uh, they made a compromise with the university that, that uh, they would let most of the students that had been expelled back, there were two of us that they would not take back, and that was me and uh, Ronnie Moore, who was one of the other student leaders. And hmm. I was told that, that the president was mad at me because 
uh, I had called up to his house one day uh, when we were a group of us student protesters wanted to meet him, meet with him, and and uh, uh, I couldn't get him on the phone. And I think I might have spoken to Mrs. Clark, and I said, I mean, I'm not sure, but but. I said, if, if, if he won't meet with us, we'll just come up there to the house. And so, so it may have been his office. I'm not sure. But in any event, I'm told that he was angry about my rudeness hmm. in that encounter. Because I remember that we ended up uh, marching to his house. That was a little bit later, I think, because we had an all-night vigil on his lawn. Uh, but this was also before we had been expelled. So Dr. Clark apparently it was pretty clear that he didn't want me back. Yeah. So they settled the lawsuit, and, and it didn't bother me that they settled it and mm. and said that, well, I wasn't going to come back because uh, maybe by that time I already had the offer to go to Clark. I'm not sure. Uh, that came because Walter Williams, who was a black student at Jackson State in Mississippi, <laughs> was in the seminar with me at the University of Wisconsin the yeah. previous summer. Yeah. And so Walter had been offered a scholarship to go to Clark because he'd been expelled uh, as student body president at Jackson State. And he said, well, I'm going to go into military, but contact my friend Diami Bailey in Baton Rouge. He's been kicked out of school there. So they contacted me while I was at the hotel there in Baton Rouge and offered me a scholarship <laughs> to go to Clark. I didn't know anything about the university, never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I looked at the catalog and saw all these white kids and this completely alien-looking environment to me, you know. In Worcester. Um, but, uh, you know, it was a, I could tell it was a good school and, and uh, uh, I didn't, I wasn't in any, in any other school. Right. And so uh, I came back to Memphis and then I had to take the SAT test here. <laughs> In order to, I mean, I'd been admitted to Clark, but I had to take the SAT. Nevertheless, I went to uh, what is now Rhodes College, which is just uh -huh. a block away, uh -huh. and I took that that sum the summer before I went to Clark. I mentioned that because at the lunch break, uh, the test administrators came over to me and the, pulled me aside, and they said that I couldn't have lunch with the rest of the students who were taking the test. So two or three of them. Uh, very nicely. I mean, they were nice about it, but they took me into the faculty dining mm. hall on the side, and I had dinner with uh, lunch with a couple of them because I couldn't with the. And this was in 1962. Wow. Um, but I took the SAT, and then that fall I went on to, to a clock. Well, how did it? How did it come about? Was that a number of uh, student leaders in the South were being expelled? And so this was a gesture made on the, led by students at Clark University uh, to raise money, and they had car washes and bake sales and the like, <laughs> and they raised uh, a couple of thousand dollars, and the university may have chipped in a little bit and offered a scholarship to some student who had been expelled from a southern school. <laughs> and con consequently, that's how I ended up there. Were there other schools that were doing similar things? I've never heard of that, of that happening. But. Uh, I don't know. You know. I do know that uh, Senator Javits uh, made note of the clock effort uh, in the Senate uh, records there <laughs> because it was an outstanding gesture on their part mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. So you, and, and as you mentioned, it was a, a bit of a different world that you entered into in Worcester at, coming from uh, Tennessee and also Louisiana. I didn't know uh, really what to expect. I mean, yeah. uh, I knew I had a free train ride because my father, I could get the pass to ride up to Massachusetts. I'd have to go all the way uh, up through upstate New York because I had to follow the route that uh, oh. Illinois Central had partnership with New York Central. And so I would go to Memphis, Chicago, and then Chicago up through Poughkeepsie and, and uh, Buffalo and all those places to ultimately oh, get to Boston. Well, actually, to Worcester. Yeah. And... Um, when I got there, the school had picked out uh, two nice students, uh, two, uh, Bob, uh, uh, I have trouble remembering his last name, I think it was Miller, and uh, Fred Jealous, and they met me at the train station. And uh, they had an apartment uh, that I was to share with them, and so they took me over. Fred, uh, by coincidence, is the uh, father of Ben Jealous, now the, uh, the national head of the NAA. But uh, uh, I was uh, I roomed with them for the first year that I was there, 
in the apartment, which was right in a building owned by the university. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you have lived on campus? Was that a, an option? Yes, it was. I okay. think, yeah. uh, but uh, I think the university was wanting to uh, create an environment for me with two, I guess, volunteers or, or mm -hmm. nice students and. Mm -hmm. A nice little—I mean, it wasn't fancy, but a nice apartment. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it—it ne it never came up. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they had right. the place for me when I got there, right. and so I just went and—and and, uh, I remember my twenty-first birthday party. They gave me a fifth of Jack Daniels. And, <laughs> yeah, so they were nice. Uh, uh, when I first got to Clark, um, the students were, of course, it was a, I was something of a cost celebrity because I was the one that they had raised the money to sure. to bring up there. Right. And uh, kids would want to talk to me about the South. Uh, and initially I would talk to them about the South and civil rights and the like, and then I got tired of it. I got tired mm -hmm. of just talking about race in the South. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I started asking them about what was going on in Worcester. Well, Worcester didn't have a large black community. It was only about 3,000 out of, I think, a couple hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that black community that they had was in a segregated area of the city, and there was not much interaction of that community with the rest of the community. As I said, the department store downtown didn't have any black uh, clerks. Uh, mm -hmm. The big factory there, Wyman Gordon, which was run by National Secretary of the John Birch Society uh, had 18 black employees, and they were all janitors. Hmm. So I st so, so by going missions. over to yeah. the Yale campus and and getting support to start this Worcester Student Movement, this WSM chapter, on the Clark campus, um, I drew in students, uh, liberal white students from the campus, as well as a handful of people from the black community in Worcester, and we formed a group. Um, and started having meetings. We began tutoring. The main mission of NSM, a part of its mission, was to tutor kids in inner city neighborhoods. And so mm. we had volunteers that were tutoring those kids. Out of our effort in Worcester was created an organization called Prospect House, which is now an ongoing um, community institution of some um, importance to Worcester. Mm. Um, uh, Abby Hoffman was living in Worcester at the time, and. Um, had come out of Brandeis and needed a cause, and he attached himself to our efforts, and mm -hmm. even though he wasn't a student, but he was living there, and he became sort of a self-appointed uh, publicist, for, publicist mm -hmm. for us, putting out a newsletter called The Drum, and uh, we came to our meetings. And, but we were primarily uh, students and members of the Worcester black community, and uh, we set about the business of fighting out uh, what was happening on the job front with minorities, and we did tackle the largest uh, industrial employer in Worcester, Wyman Gordon Company, which, as I say, was run Wyman by Gordon. Robert Stoddard, who was the national secretary of John Birch Society. We went and met with him and uh, asked him about his employment of blacks and whether he would promote them, and he said that, in essence, no. And so we picketed his plant, brought the plant to a stop at least for one day because uh, the Teamsters wouldn't cross our picket line. And I mm -hmm. filed uh, I yeah. complaints with the Massachusetts uh, Commission Against Discrimination and the Defense Department because they were a big defense contractor. And investigations were undertaken by both agencies in which they found uh, some cause and demanded or required that the plant undergo some change. So. This was a case of not only were we putting pressure, starting as just a group of young mm -hmm. activists, mm -hmm. but we were putting pressure on this big factory. And Stoddard was not just the owner of Wyman Gordon, he also owned the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, which was mm. the local newspaper, and right. the radio station there, WTAG, and was on the board of Clark. He had a lot of power, yeah. Yes. Locally. Uh, in fact, the president of Clark uh, called me in just the day of our picket and uh, was gently trying to dissuade us. He wasn't heavy-handed about it. Uh, but by that time, uh, when I called over to the picket line, uh, they were already um, uh, started. Mm. And so um, uh, the, the, the I, I had a good out with Dr. Jefferson that, that I couldn't stop it because it was already started. But um, um, we... Uh, uh, I mentioned the, the, the multifaceted strategy 
picketing, mm -hmm. but also those complaints with the Massachusetts Commission and with the Defense Department. So here we were using multifaceted strength against this corporation and made them change. Mm -hmm. And it was clear to me that that you can, as a small force, but if you use the right strategies and do your research and know where the vulnerabilities are, mm -hmm. you can force corporations to change. And that's what we did in Worcester. Mm -hmm. um, when I graduated, uh, there was an editorial in the student newspaper that said, um, one is enough. And uh, the editor was talking about that some students had talked about having another campaign to raise funds to bring a student from the South. And they said, we've had that experience once before, and he found racial problems under every <laughs> rock, so to speak, and we don't need to do that again. And. Um, um, the next mm. issue of the clock paper, though, was had a page full of letters uh, in opposition and in support of support. Yeah. Uh, that I wasn't really that that terrible uh, <laughs> a, a force on the clock campus. Clock right. gave me an honorary doctorate of laws three years ago. Okay, great. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, this is all okay. I'm curious about, you know, we're, now we're in the North and it's a couple of years later, you had been talking about the sort of, the very real sort of fear and intimidation that was so prevalent in the South when you first went, say, um, down to Southern. What was the situation like that you found a few years later and up North around Clark and in, and in Worcester, um, and what gave you the strength to do things like challenge the National Director of the John Birch Society? I didn't have much fear in Worcester. Um, the opposition to what we were doing was, there wasn't any visible, there were some students actually from the Clark campus who counter picketed against us hmm. when we picketed the plant. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, the police in charge, sergeant at, at, at the scene of our protest came over to me because uh, they had wanted some of our students to uh, let the trucks come through. Now, as I said, the Teamster trucks refused to cross the line, but there were some company-owned trucks that wanted to come on into the plant, and some of the students had taken it upon themselves to decide that they would continue to circle in the driveway and not let the trucks through. And so the police in charge came over to me, and he said, look, I don't like this son of a bitch any more than you do, but we'll have to, you can't, continue to block this driveway and mm. because Stata was was non union mm -hmm. said, but oh, okay. uh, but you can't you're gonna have to do something here and so I spoke to the kids and I told them I said look uh, they've said you're gonna have to um, stop and 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 let these trucks in and and uh, oh you're gonna be arrested now if you, I'll leave it up to you all even though I was there as part of them but I mm. was do, I was addressing them after talking to the policeman and I said, now, if you stay, I'll join you, but if, but if you want to leave, then now's the time to let these trucks through. And um, by this time, um, one of the priests that was one of our supporters intervened and pleaded with, uh, with us yet again to mm -hmm. let the trucks through, Father Gilgon, Bernie Gilgon, who was an activist priest in Worcester. And, um, and so we then relented and let the trucks come through. But I'm saying that... Uh, uh, started was at least not just for reasons of our civil rights protest, but because of the union issue, there were also some people that were that were supportive of what we were doing. Sure. But um, you know the the, the 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 opposition in the Northeast was much more refined. Mm -hmm. The Worcester Area Council of Churches invited Stoddard to speak at a luncheon at their meeting. And we contacted them and said, well, let us come and give our side. This was in, in the wake of our picket in the plant. Mm -hmm. And they refused. And so we picketed the Worcester Area Council of Churches luncheon. Um, and so, but, so it, was, it was really the opposition the quiet opposition mm -hmm. that you had to deal with. We didn't have people threatening us on the sidewalks. 
uh, one of the black ministers who was the head of the NACP in, in Worcester, Reverend Stringfield, um, criticized us picketing and said that we were going off half-cocked mm -hmm. uh, when we picketed first the downtown department store. And so uh, what we did was a number of us increased the membership of the NAA with young people, students mm -hmm. from the campus and some people in the black community. Then I called uh, the Reverend Stringfield to the side and I said, look, we're going to picket the plant and I want you to join us on the picket line. And uh, uh, I said, in essence, if you don't, um, we're going to move to vote you out at the NAACP. Hmm. And so he resigned as the head of the organization. Mm -hmm. um, but the result was, but we were moving to preempt an attack from the NAACP, which we'd seen happen in our first picket. Right. And so again, it was a matter of using strategy from within and from mm -hmm. without, going within the, within the NACP to boost the membership and therefore give ourselves a, a position of strength. Mm -hmm. um, now when I was in, uh, so in Worcester, now when I brought Malcolm X to speak, I had called Malcolm at his home in New York and asked if he would come and speak in, uh, on the campus, which he agreed to do. And then a couple of the members of the board of our organization, white ministers, said they would quit the organization if, if uh, unless we got someone to give the other point of view. And so when I told that back to Malcolm by phone, and I had gotten him on the phone at his home, it was amazing that I could, that was able to do it, but but I did. And and um, I told him that they said that I'd have to have someone to present the other point of view. And he said, well, I'll debate Dr. King. And so I said, well, all right. I said. Um, let me see what I can do. I called Atlanta and asked them if Dr. King would debate Malcolm, and they said no, uh, he's not available, but the Bayard Rustin would. Oh. And so uh, when I talked back to Malcolm, he sort of chuckled on the phone, and he said he knew that King wouldn't debate him, but he wasn't going to debate Bayard Rustin. <laughs> and so at that, I decided that if those ministers were going to quit, they, was just gonna, they were just going to have to quit because we were just going to go ahead and bring Malcolm to speak in Worcester, mm -hmm. which we did. Did he say why he didn't want to debate Rustin? He thought Rustin was just a, a lackey for okay. a, a front for King. He wanted he wanted to, to bite into King. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that was the debate he wanted. Mm -hmm. He wasn't going to debate some second. I mean Rustin wasn't true. I mean you know he's credited with being the, uh, the leading star behind the scenes of the march on sure, Washington. Sure. Sure. But, uh, that would Malcolm, have been a heck of a debate, too, I think. <laughs> it would, but, yeah. but Malcolm was going to have no part of that. Sure, sure. And, um, and so um, he came, and, and um, I spent the day with him, and he was just an extraordinary mm. person. Uh, I went with him to the radio station for an interview, Stoddard's station, because mm -hmm. of the WTAG, but um, uh, Julie Chase Fuller, who was one of the uh, disc jockeys there, um, uh, conducted the interview, and she was very supportive of what we were doing in, in Worcester. Uh, and she, she and I, and Malcolm were uh, did the interview together. I, I did mostly listening, listening, mm -hmm. and it was mostly between her and Malcolm. There was a couple of times during the interview when I was kind of asked whether I agreed with Malcolm, and I was careful not to get drawn into mm -hmm. a, a, a me versus Malcolm X debate because I tended to agree with a lot of what Malcolm was saying. Now, of course, Malcolm, as you know, was not uh, in favor of nonviolence, and he made that very clear. Mm. Uh, but I was never an advocate of nonviolence as a belief, as I said earlier. We were forced into nonviolence by the reality of the circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went uh, from New Orleans to Bogalusa with, with these two priests uh, in the summer of, let's see, I was working that summer uh, in New Orleans, and uh, we went over, and that would have been then the summer of 65. Uh, we were going to participate in a protest in Bogalusa. And we got met on the other end of the Lake Pontchartrain Bridge by an armed carload of people with the Deacons for Defense and Justice. And they followed us into town, uh, put us up at a house where they kept watch. And then at the rally, the march that we went to, they had people carrying shotguns alongside mm -hmm. the march. Now, and, and that didn't bother me in the least bit. I was rather reassured mm -hmm. because the deacon's philosophy was 
that uh, we're going to fight back. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, uh, and I don't know how historically accurate this is, but there, there was some scuttlebutt that some whites had run through the black community attempting to intimidate them with some gunfire and that the deacons had fired back and mm -hmm. wounded someone, mm -hmm. but that it had been, had been downplayed because they did not want uh, that publicly known. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, uh, now, now the kind of violence that I would have been against, however, uh, would have been uh, uh, random violence. I mean, self-defense was one thing, right. but proactive violence, for example, with the weathermen Mm -hmm. uh, and others were doing firebombing. Uh, and, yeah, right. uh, that kind of thing. Um, I would not have necessarily outwardly condemned it uh, to those who believed so firmly in their cause uh, that they chose to resort to that. Mm. Um, uh, but but I would not have been a part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But. but I can I can accept that some people uh, would feel so strongly mm -hmm. uh, of the need for change, and that other means had failed, mm -hmm. that they would have to make some uh, take some acts of violence. Um, for me, and, and particularly as and and I think for black people in general, uh, I did not think that was a, a particularly effective uh, and defensible strategy. Mm -hmm. But you, um, Mo Melissa, did, did, were you involved with the Hicks family? Did they? We, we interviewed the Hicks family in Mo Melissa, and the, the man who was Hicks. Was yes, I, I thought you said Hooks. I, that's, okay, Hicks. Yes. In fact, I, I think I met some of them then when I was over there. Well, also that same summer that I went over for that march, I had actually I was what I was doing was I was uh, in my second year of law school, I believe, um, between my second, first and second year, and I was working actually out of the office of Ernest Moriel, who was practicing law at the time, uh, along with A.P. Thoreau. Ernest who, I'm sorry? Ernest Moriel. Moriel. Yeah. Um, and he was, uh, one of, again, one of the black lawyers doing some rights work, and he'd given me office space in his office in New Orleans. Um, he later became mayor of New Orleans, and oh. uh, uh, his son is actually now the national head of the uh, Urban League, okay. Bach Moriel. But um, um, the reason I was in New Orleans that summer, a summer of '65. W would you mind just waiting until the phone uh, ends? Or? Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, when I was in New Orleans in the summer of '65, I was. Uh, in between my first and second year of law school, and the NAA Legal Defense Fund office in New York had hired uh, a half dozen or so uh, law students, mostly blacks, uh, and they sent one of us each to a southern state. That was the year that Title VII had become effective. It had been passed in 64, but you could begin to file complaints in 65. And so the Legal Defense Fund sent us out uh, to get employees to file Title VII complaints. Yeah. And so I had gone over to Bogalusa even prior to that first march, and I had um, uh, gotten workers at the Crown Zellerbach plant in Bogalusa to file Title VII complaints. In fact, those were some of the first complaints and most effective complaints under Title VII. But that was the work that I was doing with the Legal Defense Fund that summer. Okay, very interesting. And then you went back, you finished uh, law school at Yale. Yeah, I, at, at that time I had done a year's law study at Boston University. Mm -hmm. And um, and while there I'd gotten involved with a group called uh, Law Students Civil Rights Research Council, right. LISCRIC. And um, uh, it had been formed by some Northeastern law students. Um, and uh, it was founded, uh, funded by private foundations, New York uh, Fund, uh, Taconic, Rockefeller mm -hmm. Brothers, New mm -hmm. York Foundation, some others. And the idea with the LISCRIC, Law Student Civil Rights Research Council, was that the lawyers in the South who were doing civil rights work were so overwhelmed that they needed help. And the best way to help them was to take some of the top law students from universities around the country and send them to the South. And so we had funding to 
hire these law students in the mm -hmm. summer and send them to uh, all over the South. We would hire about anywhere from 100 to 200 law students, pay them uh, $30 a week, which was just enough for them to pay for their food and laundry, mm -hmm. and we'd put them out in the black community and they would stay with people in the community. The lawyers would typically help find a place for them to stay while they were assigned to the lawyers' offices, and they'd work there. Well, um, it was a twofold strategy with Liskrick. Uh, the first part of it was to provide this much-needed help to, this, to these lawyers. We didn't confine ourselves to the South, but I'd say 90% of our students were in the South, but we also put lawyers in civil liberties offices uh, in, outside of the South to work with ACLU people. In mm -hmm. fact, the headquarters for the organization was in the national office of the ACLU. Oh, it was? Okay. And so my first year of law st study at Boston University, I organized a chapter of this organization uh, at Boston University. And so um, that summer was when I did the work with the Legal Defense Fund. Um, and well, as then, part of, uh, was that an assignment from this organization? No, or was actually that it, was, it was separate. Separate, okay. And uh, and then I got accepted into Yale as a, a transfer student, okay. and so uh, instead of returning to BU, I went to um, to New Haven. Mm -hmm. I actually had applied while I was at Clark to Yale and Columbia and Harvard and several mm -hmm. other top schools, and had been rejected by all of them. I'd been accepted at Boston University. Mm -hmm. I was on my way back to uh, Clark one day with uh, one of my schoolmates by car. And we stopped, I asked him to stop at Yale, and we stopped over on the campus, and I went to the dean of admissions office. And it turned out to be a one-armed white man, of course all of the top people there were white, uh, from Bolivar, Tennessee, about 80 miles up the road from Memphis. And uh, Dean Tate, Jack B. Tate, and um, we got to talking, and he took a liking to me, and we talked a little bit about my civil rights background. and. And he said, well, let me see if there's someone around still that I can introduce you to. Well, none of the people, key people were on the campus at the time. So yeah. he said, well, you go on back and let me see what I can do. So it, the end result was he got me on a waiting list, but they never had the openings. And so he said, you That's go on and do your year. first year and then get in touch with me. And so it was that summer while I was working out of Muriel's office that Dean Tate sent me a letter and said I could come to Yale as a transfer. Hmm. So if you hadn't just stopped over on the campus, that never would have happened. Never would have happened. That's amazing. I'd already been rejected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. That's a great story, though. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, just, I guess, continuing with the chronology that you, um, after you graduate from law school at Yale. Um, Following law school, I was, uh, um, the, the second summer, um, after I'd done that summer in uh, New Orleans, uh, I worked out of New York, uh, traveling around the South to coordinate these law students. Mm -hmm. And so I had developed a pretty good uh, friendship with many of the leaders on different campuses. And we had campuses from uh, California to New York. And um, there were about 35 law schools that were members of the, that mm -hmm. had chapters of Liskrick. And so I was elected to national director. The national okay. director would serve for, it would, each year they'd pick a new national director, and that would be someone who had just finished law school. Mm -hmm. And I would, and, and so I went from law school to the uh, headquarters, which was, as I say, in the national office of the ACLU. Mm -hmm. and, in uh, New York City. In New York. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did my first year out of law school. And, and um, um, interestingly, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Bill Robinson, who was the director before me, had gotten a deferment because by this time uh, the draft was very alive and active. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, of uh, and I was prime candidate in terms of my age and being single uh, mm -hmm. to be drafted. That had nothing to do, quite honestly, with uh, the work that I was doing with Liskrig. But Robinson had gotten a draft deferment uh, working with the organization, and so I applied for a deferment as well when I went to work with Liskrick. And um, I had letters from Jack Pemberton, who had been the director of the ACLU, and uh, I think Bob Carter even might have sent a letter from me. I had had some key national civil rights people to write letters saying that this work that I was doing was in the national interest. Mm -hmm. So I came down to Memphis and I met with the draft board. We had one black on the draft board. My brother had talked with him. 
Mm -hmm. And he was very supportive. And I think there were about four whites on the board, and I came down and talked with them. One of the white ladies, when I got to the, into the meeting with them, she was uh, intrigued to know what I was, the kind of work I was doing, and we got to talk about civil rights. Well, it turns out she had had a daughter who had been somewhat involved in some civil mm -hmm. rights activities mm -hmm. in the North. But the long and short of that story was that they, after a very cordial meeting, they gave me a deferment. Uh, and this was in 1967 hmm. uh, from a draft board here in Memphis that said that my work as a director in New York was in the national interest and therefore I, they granted me a deferment. Right. And so, um, of course, that year's deferment actually got me past the age limit where I would have been oh, so then you were drafted. Yeah. Because yeah. I was kind of torn, uh, really, uh, personally, because uh, if I had gotten drafted, I... I didn't quite know uh, what I would have done. Uh, I was pretty strong in my belief that the war was wrong, mm -hmm. and I was I don't think that I was prepared to put my life on the line uh, and go to Vietnam mm -hmm. on a war that I felt was wrong. So but I, I never had to come to really make those tough choices. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I uh, I got the deferment, mm -hmm. but I think that I would have rather gone to jail than to have gone to to the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, it was of course this was uh, sixty seven, the height of it. I'd been going to teach ins in Boston, uh, Staunton Lynn and and Howard Zinn and others were mm -hmm. uh, speaking at these uh, and and making some very persuasive uh, presentations about the wrong of the war. And and I was convinced that it was wrong, mm -hmm. and so I was. I, Norman Thomas was one of the people that I brought to speak at the Clark campus while I was still in Worcester. So anyway, I did the work there with the uh, uh, Liskrick Law Students uh, Civil Rights Research Council for that year. Um, in fact, I uh, raised uh, special grant money and sent ten law students down here to work with Senate with the lawyers during the sanitation strike uh, when they were oh, wow. when they were on strike. And uh, the first suspect, uh, Alex Herter, I think was his name, is now a law professor at Vanderbilt. Uh, Alex Herter, Herter, I think it's Herter. But he was the first person taken into custody in Memphis as a suspect in the assassination because he was a white person down around the Lorraine Motel at the time of the assassination. Of course, he was released uh, relatively uh, soon uh, afterwards. Mm. But... Um, uh, the night of the assassination, I was in my office, um, and the office had basically closed down. This was about 6 o'clock New York time, which was closer to 7 here, and my secretary came out and told me that the radio had announced that she'd heard on the radio that Dr. King had been shot, and then minutes later she came back out and said that he was dead. Mm -hmm. Well, I was working late that night because I was getting my, I was had a flight to Memphis scheduled for the next day because there was going to be a, a march uh, that Dr. King was to lead within three or four days, I think April the 8th. And so, um, of course, New York was um, tense and, and uh, on edge that night, uh, and I did take yeah. a plane the next day and come to Memphis. Uh, and then I went on from Memphis to Atlanta, uh, where they had his funeral services, but I couldn't get into Ebenezer because it was packed, so I stood mm -hmm. outside and then went over to the Morehouse campus uh, where they had a uh, caravan from the church, and I think they brought his body over there, and they had speakers and things at the Morehouse yeah, campus right. as well. Yeah. But uh, following my work with the Law Students uh, Council in New York, uh, which ended in '68. Uh, then I had to decide, uh, I had offers to stay in New York and uh, work either at uh, NYU Law School or uh, with some foundations. And uh, I had an offer to go out to work with the Cummins Engine Foundation. Uh, Phil Sorensen was running that, Ted Sorensen's brother, and uh, had made me, a, had offered me a position with the foundation out there. And, but I'd been out to California because uh, we had chapters at Hastings School of Law and at Bolt Hall and at UCLA. Mm -hmm. And when I was in, in the Bay Area there visiting the chapters during that year that I was running the organization, 
um, I had a great time, and it was such a beautiful area. Mm -hmm. And um, one of and one of the former presidents or directors of my group was then working with legal services in San Francisco, okay. Steve Antler. And so he persuaded the director out there to offer me a job on the staff of legal services in San Francisco. What was the last name? Steve Antler. Antler. A-N-T-L-E-R. Okay. And so um, um, That's how you I, I chose to move out to San Francisco in, in the... Um, Winter of um, of '68, I actually took a two months and and went to Europe um, uh, by myself with with a book called um, Europe on Five Dollars a Day. <laughs> I remember I it? Out. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it worked sometimes, but fortunately, I uh, on two or three occasions it was nice enough to uh, lucky enough to meet somebody who would take me in, and that kind of helped me part of the way that while, while I was staying around over in Europe, but uh, then I came out, uh, out to California, and uh, that was uh, about uh, October or November of 68, and okay. started practicing law with, uh, in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and uh, continued to do that with legal services. I was in the central office uh, doing test case litigation, primarily on areas of consumer fraud. Um, and I became outspoken among the, we had central, uh, central office and then there were neighborhood offices, two of which were run by black lawyers. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, you have to always leave your own motives uh, up for examination, uh, whether by others or by yourself. And um, uh, when I had taken that job, I thought that I'd kind of, reached an understanding with the director that I'd be able to do some other things. I, but I think that part of it is I, I'm not well fit to be, to work for people, I don't think. I mean, to, to be on, to be in a job. I mean, I, I started asking questions mm. and I started challenging the authority of the leadership and talking about the fairness with which other employees uh, were being treated in the central office and in the neighborhoods. Mm. And um, and it led to some polarization uh, within the offices, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in the central office, uh, to the point that um, uh, I went to the board meeting and said that the director ought to resign, mm. um, mm -hmm. which he did. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But um, they hired a black guy that came in, and he fired me with them. <laughs> <laughs> Very short time after. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and, and, and I filed a lawsuit. One of yeah. the other lawyers, a white lawyer on the staff who was one of my supporters, filed a suit for me in federal court, and, and, and uh, we settled it by their agreeing to rescind my termination. And then I, but I told them that, I, and agreed to, and I did resign from the staff of legal services. Oh, okay, right. And so that would have been after being there probably a couple of years. Hmm. Uh, and the issues were, there were some genuine issues about employee rights and, and mm -hmm. the way, I mean, it wasn't anything blatant, uh, but, but it was the, 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 minor, the minority and the ethnic staff, I didn't think, uh, including the lawyers, were being treated with the same degree of fairness that others were. Mm -hmm. and, okay. uh, and they agreed, I mean, the ethnic and black lawyers agreed with me, but they, as often happens, people don't speak up. I mean, they mm -hmm. support you, and they'll tell you quietly how much they agree with you. But you get left out there on that limb, you know. They don't want to go to battle with you. <laughs> yeah. right. And, of course, that's part of it. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're not willing to be on that limb by yourself, mm -hmm. then you better stay at home because uh, that's mm -hmm. going to happen time and again. So you found yourself on that limb a few times in your, yes. in your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been blessed that uh, when I fall off the limb, there's always a, another net somewhere, you know. And, uh, another limb. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it becomes to. that. Yeah. <laughs> because while Climb I was with uh, uh, legal services in San Francisco, um, a young white fellow came to me, a volunteer, and confessed that he and his wife had a lot of money. And he didn't know what to do with it. He felt guilty about it. Hmm. And... Um, 
uh, after he turned down my initial suggestion that they could give me a million dollars, <laughs> which I actually did tell him. About it. And he, and he lo looked at me seriously and said, well, he would think about it, and he and his wife, he went and talked with his wife about it. And the reason I said that was because you can't make change without money. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's in civil rights or any other kind mm. of struggle, it takes mm -hmm. money. It took money in the movement. Mm -hmm. It took money with our law students. I, I was going to mention this when you talked about um, the foundational, the foundations that supported your 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 law student organization, because that, to me, that's that is one of the great untold stories of, of the civil rights movement at that time. Was the Rockefeller Foundation support, Taconic, the movement couldn't have survived without Not at all. without those. And then, and when those foundations did disappear. Or stop giving money. It really, it really changed. It the did landscape. absolutely. Yeah. And what happened was that Congress uh, saw that the impact that these foundations uh, was having, mm -hmm. and they then attacked these foundations and intimidated them. And went after them and backed them off. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, I mean, one of the, I mean, Leslie Dunbar, mm -hmm. who led the Field Foundation. Yeah. Um, you know, he was one of the, I mean, uh, Marion Wright, he got Marion Wright uh, started in building the Children's Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he was close to, he, he got John Lewis. In fact, uh, it, it came to the, when Ver, Vernon Jordan had headed the voter education project in Atlanta for the Southern Regional Council. When Vernon left that, <coughs> uh, the, it came down to whether they were going to hire me or uh, John Lewis. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say they, Leslie Dunbar was really the, the person who was talking to both of us about taking that position as the um, head of the VEP, Voter Education Project. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leslie, <coughs> uh, he said, well, look, he says, uh, John can use this position at this time much more than uh, the news. In essence, what he hmm. is how he kind of made the decision. It was two good men that he had to do it, and he hmm. picked John. Mm -hmm. But um, um, when I was in San Francisco, I was uh, uh, he hired me as a consultant to the uh, Field Foundation, so I would go back oh, okay. and yeah. meet with the board, which was chaired by Ruth Field. Um, but uh, if you want it, I organized uh, while I was on the city council in Berkeley, uh, and two black kids got killed on the campus of Southern uh, in a protest demonstration, mm -hmm. and that was, I think, around 1972, 71, 72. And uh, the media was unclear about how they got killed or who killed them, or they'd been killed by a sheriff's deputy on campus. Uh, a line of sheriff's deputies started firing at the students and two of them ended up dead, and they said they never knew who, who did it. Hmm. And so I called the uh, black lawyer that I knew in Baton Rouge, and he said, well, you could help if you came down. And I called Les Dunbar in New York, and I said, Les, I said, I'd like to go down to Baton Rouge. Um, and so he said, well, all right. And so he gave me $5,000 of money from Field Foundation, and I then contacted uh, John Lewis and mm -hmm. uh, Awusu, Awusu Sadaka, who was the leader of a black nationalist group, and uh, my brother out of Memphis and I took another black councilman with me from Berkeley, and we, Haywood Burns, who was heading the National Conference of Black Lawyers, and we went down to Baton Rouge and convened what we call the Black People's Committee of Inquiry into the shooting deaths of these students. And we had uh, uh, hearings, and, and then actually the governor came to the hearing, the Governor hmm. Edwards. And, um, but we focused attention and got the story out, but, but I mentioned that because I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't been able to pick up the phone call Les Dunbar sure. and get that five thousand dollars from him, mm -hmm. or it may have been ten, but it, because actually when I left California, he gave me five thousand dollars to help me relocate from California. Oh, to really? Memphis. Yeah. So he was helping out individual. Yeah, he gave me a grant. He yeah. it was uh, to to write a story on black lawyers in Tennessee. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that was yeah, it's a way of getting it done, getting you some money. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And and. Uh, but you see, if I went to him when I had a project, uh, I could go to uh, the Norman Fund or the, the Vernon Eagle at, uh, uh, I think it was the New World Foundation, um, Leslie Dunbar at Field. But Leslie could talk to the heads of the other foundations, and then they would act as a consortium hmm. to put the money together to, New, to what fund What was the, the first project. one that you said, New World? Uh, 
uh, Debbie, uh, uh, Debbie was with the Norman Fund. Norman Fund. Uh -huh. And there was Taconic. Mm -hmm. There was Rockefeller Brothers. Mm -hmm. There was the New York Foundation. Um, Cummins Engine Foundation out mm -hmm. of uh, uh, Indiana. Uh, Stern Family Fund out of New Orleans. Um, so these were all well known to, to people in the movement, mm -hmm. where they could be, where money could be uh, exactly solicited. And it was from. the same group, mm -hmm. same group of foundations. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and without them, yeah. you know, much of this wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And they had the kind of relationship with the, with leaders, including King and others. Sure. Cesar Chavez, mm -hmm. done by helped uh, uh, the United Farm Workers mm -hmm. uh, through the support that he could generate. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, uh, yes, these, uh, so my friends in San Francisco, they were, uh, it was ironic because when my friend came to me and he said, right. he, uh, like, he said, you know, um, okay, we'll my friend came to me and said, uh, you know, I told you earlier that I had some money, but it actually is quite a lot of money. And. We, I'd like your ideas what to do it. And I said, well, give me a million dollars. The reason I said that was because uh, I knew that my commitment would be to use that money to stir up things, mm -hmm. to make things happen, to change things. It wasn't just to go live comfortably on a boat somewhere. <laughs> but I would be free of strings if it was my money. So he came back yeah. and he said, well, we're not going to do that, but what we will do is we'll, we'll bring a million dollars from the Northeast out here to California and set up a trust to put you in charge of it. And then you can take the money, not, he said that you can take all of the uh, uh, interest or dividends that mm -hmm. it earns because they put it into uh, an account at Bank of America, and uh, which was in turn invested. And they say you can take the dividend money and give it away however you wish, and plus you can go into the corpus at least to $100,000 without talking to us. Okay. And they paid me $10,000 salary to do this. Now, the purpose for them doing this, setting it up, was they said, we want you to give this money to projects that, don't, that are not tax exempt, that the ones that are now getting support from foundations and the like, those are not the ones we want to support. We want to give it to uh, non-tax exempt <laughs> organizations. And so I then was able to pick and choose different projects going on around the country, and I did that. Of course, that was just a part-time position, mm -hmm. but I also, as I said, was uh, engaged as a consultant to Field Foundation at the same time, and uh, was a consultant with another group that was uh, recruiting minority law students, uh, CLEO, Council on Legal Education Opp Opportunity, recruiting black students, I think that was the name of it. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, so with the funds that I, so after I had gotten fired at legal, legal services, in right. essence, uh, I was able to continue to float with the independent mm -hmm. income I had coming in. Well, I was living in Berkeley because. Now, did uh, that foundation ever have a name, or was that a quiet? Yes, we named it uh, the Bread Limited Trust. Bread. Bread Limited Bread. Trust. <laughs> Meaning, we didn't have a whole lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. And uh, uh, and so uh, I was at the same time on the board of uh, Berkeley Legal Services. In fact, at one point I became chairman of the board of Berkeley Legal Services. And I became active in the Berkeley Black Caucus. Uh, and so by the time Ron Dellums ran, he had been on the city council and was very visible as a councilman out there. And so, because of Dellums' uh, eloquent uh, statements against the war, mm -hmm. uh, he became very supported by the white left, and so that's how he got to uh, be elected Congress mm -hmm. from there. And so when Dellums got elected to the Congress, my friend Ira Simmons and I, who had, Ira was a lawyer that had come out um, west, and was working up in Sacramento, and I had encouraged him to come to Berkeley and uh, helped him to get a post with Berkeley Legal Services because I was on the board there. Uh, also a black lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, he and I were 
uh, spending the evening just relaxing at his home. Uh, and we said, well, we ought to run for the council because Dellums had gotten elected, so there was a vacancy created. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we said, well, we'll run as a ticket a team, two of us. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know anything about the politics of Berkeley. Uh, this was just looking, what do we do next kind of thing. You mm -hmm. know? And so um, it, but that choice, that decision we made came at the same time that the white left had been planning and organizing for a good while to run candidates in the Berkeley city elections. Mm -hmm. And they had formed their group called the April Coalition. Okay. And um, the, uh, so the, the deal that they had set up was that uh, the white left, the April Coalition, would pick two candidates, two whites, and the Berkeley Black Caucus would pick two black candidates and those candidates would run as a slate Got it. to be endorsed by Ron Dellums. And so by this time, Ira and I were regular attendees at the Berkeley Black Caucus meeting. Uh, I had even given $500 or so of my friend's money to help them get a headquarters. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we were liked within the caucus, and we announced that we were going to run for council. Well, this kind of got the caucus upset because they already had in mind who they were going to put onto the ticket in these two seats. And so they kind of pleaded with Ira and me uh, not to run, and Dellums pleaded with us. And so when they saw that we were going to move forward, then the plea was, well, why don't one of you run? And I said, no, that's not going to work because I didn't want to, if I showed that I was willing to dump Ira, because he didn't have the money, I had the money. Got it. Uh, then that would sort of weaken me at the beginning, and 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 might create an adversary mm -hmm. that I didn't want. So I said, no, we all, we, it's both of us or nothing. So in the end, we forced the caucus to accept us as their two candidates because they knew that I had the money, and that I was going to run. I went to my friends, mm -hmm. and I said, look, I'm going to run for the council. Uh, I need you to put up the money. I need to use your money, is what I said. Right. <laughs> and they said, all right. And so um, so that's how I got to be, uh, the two of us got onto the ticket mm -hmm. with uh, Lonnie Hancock and, and Rick Brown, who was the student. And so the April Coalition knew nothing about us. Uh, mm -hmm. We had had no dealings with them. And I'm going to turn that off. Okay, it's gone. Great. So, um, just pick up where we were, we had been talking about the, the formation of the April Coalition. Uh, you, you and I are are enter the uh, are, are are put on the ticket. Yes, and uh, the the thing about it was that uh, this was my first foray into elected politics mm -hmm. as a candidate. And I'd never really seen myself as running for office. Uh, in fact, when I went to sign up as a candidate at City Hall, uh, the city court clerk uh, asked to see my voter registration, and I wasn't registered. And so I had to go register before I could sign up as a candidate. I had not lived in Berkeley but three months before the election. Mm -hmm. The election was April. I moved from Kensington, which was a suburb uh, adjacent to Berkeley, into Berkeley uh, 90 days before the election in order to qualify. Got it. And so, and I'd never, to be quite candid, I'd never been to a council meeting or even in the council chambers. But as I said, I and I had made the decision that we were going to run. We thought it would be a good forum. We'd, we'd been there long enough to see the energy and the politics of the area, and so we thought we could introduce a new thought. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, uh, when I had my announcement, uh, I made a statement, and I don't think that people were paying much attention because, again, we were very new, but I said that my first priority is going to be to the interest of the black community. And that was pure Southern. That was, mm. that was Diami Bailey speaking from in the context of my experience in politics here in the South, where if you're a black politician, then, you're, you the, then that was what you were about. You were about speaking for and advancing the interests of blacks. Mm -hmm. And so I did not see that as being necessarily much different from what my agenda should and would be uh, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, 
I, I knew that, that the interest of whites, I could look at the platform and the work that was being done. We also knew that we were looked upon with suspicion by the black, uh, indigenous black community there because they were not that supportive of the white left. They always had questions about the motives, and even though the Panthers were close with the white left, uh, and, and there was support for the Panthers, but there was some suspicion or discomfort there, mm -hmm. too. So here mm -hmm. we are, newcomers, and we had to establish our own sense of legitimacy, first with a base. That would be the black community. And in fact, uh, the April Coalition wanted us to run a joint campaign office. I said, no. I said, we'll open our own office in the black community, and we're not going to start carrying your two candidates with us into the, camp, into the community to campaign until we've gotten out there and introduced ourselves, and then we'll bring you in. Mm -hmm. And so early on in the campaign, we, we, create, we ruffled some feathers in terms of, of the position. We had already ruffled the feathers of the caucus. We had uh, 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 put, put Dellums in a fix in terms of having to endorse us, and one of the people that he wanted to run was his good friend Ken Simmons, who was going to be one of the two that was already supposed to fill those seats. And so uh, by the time we won the election, Mm -hmm. uh, and we had started working with the uh, bringing in the the white candidates into the black community, but uh, but by this time we were uh, pretty strong forces in our own right uh, as politicians, uh, having to run a very strong campaign. I brought in Merle Evers, who walked the streets mm -hmm. of Berkeley with us to help us campaign. I had uh, Julian Bond to cut uh, a radio spot for me, and uh, uh, we had a damn good. Uh, campaign manager that we hired. We had two initially that were not that good, and we ended up with one who knew, who knew what he was doing, uh, Bo Sidna, who had campaigned with Birch Bayh out in Indiana. He was a law student at that time at Bolt. And so came election day, we were on a roll. We had the coalition. Now, we had some friction. There were points in which the coalition was about to fall apart because of the, our determination to set our own agenda. Hmm. Uh, but but we held held together, and then came election. We won two of the uh, three seats. Lonnie Rent won the other one, and their fourth candidate lost. And so we came in too strong uh, to to one strong on the white left, at least the far white left. And again, because Berkeley's left was oh. not all homo homogeneous. You mm -hmm. had, I mean, one of my strongest supporters then and throughout was. Uh, Dan Siegel, who had been the president of student body at UC Berkeley, who sort of was speaking on the campus when he said, let's go down there and retake the park, and that's what led to um, a, a deadly confrontation down on Telegraph Avenue about uh, uh, the demonstrations against People's Park. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, So I had to support, and then I had some run-ins with, uh, with the Panthers, with Huey Newton. Mm -hmm. uh, Huey wanted me to join the Panthers. Uh, again, I'm not a joiner. I, uh, I tried to make that as diplomatically clear to Huey as I could that I would support his programs. He said, you know, you come put your office in ours, we'll feature you in our Black Panther newspaper. And uh, I, I begged off from that. Well, I would go to Huey's penthouse at 1200 Lakeshore Drive, Ira and I, we'd meet with him and talk with him from time to time and uh, have some Chevy's Regal and, and, uh, and, and have an enjoyable visit. But uh, he then asked me for money, asked me for $25,000, and I told him that I didn't have it. And from that point, he began to become threatening, and, and uh, I had to stop hmm. visiting with Huey. But, uh, but I continued to support on the council the programs uh, that the Panthers were pushing, uh, the free breakfast program we funded, uh, some of their day camp programs and other things. Um, the conservatives who had initially said they were going to recall all three of us, said then, that, well, let's not recall Lonnie Hancock. She's not a big problem. That Bailey is the problem. But they wanted to get both me and Iris Simmons, my, my colleague. But then Will Sweeney, who was a conservative black council member, the first black councilman in Berkeley, said, well, you can't do that. If you're going to drop off the white woman on here, then you can't just run, against the, run a recall against the two blacks. And so at that point, they said, well, let's drop Iris Simmons. And so I was then the one they chose to, uh, to focus in on because they had figured, and I think correctly so, that if they could get me, uh, then they, and, and they, and they succeeded in that, that they would be able to, to stop the force of what we were doing, which was uh, using the uh, council chamber uh, as a megaphone to demand change and get change. Mm -hmm. Filibuster in the meetings? Yes, I did. 
Uh, I would talk in the council meetings at some times to the point that the mayor, who was black, would say, well, Mr. Bell, you out of order. And uh, I would keep talking, and he would ask the clerk to turn my microphone off, and I would stand and continue to talk. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was, we had a crowd, typically the cr meetings were crowded with people, and, and we had issues that we were fighting, and I had a staff, because I had taken uh, not only uh, when I filed the, my campaign account showing that I'd spent $25,000 uh, $30, in the campaign and, and uh, I listed uh, twenty-five as being anonymous, which you could do in California hmm. at the time, and that raised a lot of eyebrows of where's the money coming from. So not only was I then being accused of being a carpetbagger, because that was one of the things that the con conservatives used against me, but then the question was, well, where is he getting his funding from? Well, the, the, the agreement that I had made with my friends was that I was not going to put their name out in public. I mean, they were mm -hmm. two quiet people, young people, and they did not want the notoriety. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, not, Mike Wallace interviewed me on 60 Minutes and uh, asked me, well, where's your money coming from? And I was a bit surprised because he had been very charming. We had met on the campus of UC Berkeley, and then we'd driven over to my, um, I had a little cottage uh, right near the Berkeley Hills. and. We sat out on the patio, and as soon as the camera started rolling, he became quite a different person and, <laughs> and, and went after me. Yeah. And he wanted to know where was the money coming from, and I was a little surprised by that. And I said, well, I'm not going to tell you. He said, well, you, you, here you are, you, you're living up here in a nice place, and you're driving a nice car, and people have a right to know. I said, well, the less you know about me, the stronger I am. I'm not going to let people know everything about me. And I felt that way, that, that, that if you know the source of my support, then you know where you can make your attack. Mm. And uh, so I didn't tell him. Well, this aired actually on 60 Minutes, this little mm. segment. But before he aired it, he called me from mm -hmm. New York and he said, uh, Diami, I'm putting this show together and I'm going to give you one last opportunity to tell me where your money's coming from. And I said, well, I told you I'm not going to tell you. He said, well, if you don't tell us, we're going to find out anyway. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, there's a group that's uh, put up some funds to find out where your money's coming from. So I called Les Dunbar after that. And back in New York. And I said, Les, I said, uh, Mike Wallace tells me that somebody's put up money to find out where my money is coming from. And he said, well, let me look into it. And so he called me back and he said, uh, sure enough, that there was a group called the Fund for Investigative Journalism hmm. and that they had gotten a grant from the Stern family out of New Orleans to find out where my money was coming from. Now, uh, this continued to be a sore point uh, in Berkeley. Uh, and, and, and it was kind of dogged at my heels uh, mm. because I wouldn't uh, tell who the source was. At one point, there was a, a uh, counterintelligence black spy for the uh, government for California who actually revealed himself as such. He would go into radical organization and stir up dissent and distrust. And he had infiltrated my campaign. He wrote, wrote about mm. it in a book, uh, The Glass House Tapes. But uh, at one point, he went on radio in, in Los Angeles and said he had given me $10,000 to help him infiltrate the Andrews Davis campaign. And I had to then go to KPF-A, uh, 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 the sister station in, in Berkeley. And he was on the microphone in Los Angeles where he was making this outlandish charge. And I told him, told the station there that you better investigate this before you run it. Well, clearly what he was trying to do was smoke me out. He knew that I couldn't reveal my financial sources, and he was trying to discredit me. I, the guy, I thought, was just a, a bum drunk who was hanging right. around the campaign headquarters. Right. But in truth, he actually was a spy. Hmm. And uh, uh, fortunately for me, uh, a reporter for Mohammed Speaks, a black Muslim newspaper, came out from Chicago and investigated the story, and they did a good story. KPFA didn't air the, the charges, but I was... Uh, in a rather tough pickle there for a few hmm. minutes mm -hmm. based upon this kind of uh, activity. Wow. Yeah. But again, that's the kind of thing that you had to live with and go with. At one time, uh, my life was uh, threatened. I had to have around the clock security. They, somebody said they knew about a, a contract on my life, and uh, it turned out it was an extortion plot where someone wanted me to pay them some money. I had to. Uh, he was eventually arrested by the Berkeley police. Um, but uh, so it was. There were a few dull moments in the yes. uh, period, but yeah. but again, we got changed. That was mm -hmm. an important thing. Mm -hmm. we, we made things happen. Mm -hmm. hey, I'll take a quick break for a second. Do you have your? Uh, Better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 
the first thing I said to my fiance was, "You got to tell me if there's anything in my yes, teeth." Yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> um, all right, so that yeah, that was a pretty adventurous uh, time. So they got the signatures on the yeah. petition. Yeah. Uh, the way recall works is that if you get 25% uh, uh, of the people who voted in the last election to sign a petition, then you're forced into an election. Okay. And so they had 18,000 people already that had voted with them in mm -hmm. the election when we were defeated. And so all they needed to do was organize a campaign with the money from the business community and the conservatives and uh, put on the ballot the question, shall Diame and Bailey be recalled, yes or no? Well, in order to survive, once they get those signatures, uh, then you have to get a majority. So mm -hmm. it's no longer the situation where I had won with a plurality, but I never had a majority because the conservatives were still in the majority in Berkeley at that time, and they knew that. And so I knew that by the time they got those signatures, that it was that that my chances of defeated the recall were going to be rather slim. Right. Um, but and I knew that for two and a half years that I was under the specter. Of, of that happening. And it sounds like they were, because of the way they could do that, they were going to recall somebody from your, yes. from that ticket. Yeah. Oh. And uh, um, a friend of mine, Roger Baldwin, who was uh, a founder of the ACLU, well, I knew him because uh, in New York, uh, his nephew and I were good friends, and he had introduced me to Roger, and we had had lunch a couple of times. Mm -hmm. He came out to the Bay Area to visit during the recall, and, and I picked him up, and he said, uh, uh, just pull over to the side of the road. He said, look, he said, I've been out here, and um, people I had that, that uh, the information I get is that you're not going to beat this recall unless you tell where your money is coming from because people just don't um, hmm. like that kind of uh, not knowing that kind of thing. And so that was another factor that, that uh, I'm sure was on the table. Um, but what had happened was that uh, my friends had closed down the trust as more and more questions began to a be asked about the money, especially after I had, after I had won and, and reported that anonymous contribution. So they um, had given me $100,000, uh, which they paid the taxes on, and I used that money to pay staff. So I had a staff mm. um, of, well, actually as many as 13 people. Mm. Um, uh, several of them were students, so I could get them on work study, so I didn't have to pay them full salaries. Then I had uh, one full-time person assigned to me by the Joint Center for Political Studies back in Washington. And uh, so I put together this quite competent staff. So whenever I went to the council meetings, I had these thick books of information uh, because my staff would go out, they would research all of the agenda items, they'd talk with people in the community, and there's nothing that brings about change more than information properly mm. used. And, that, and that's what I went in and they're armed with on the council. And that helped me to make a difference as a council member. Um, and so, um, but by the time of the recall, I'd used up a great deal of that hundred grand. And um, I had probably a third of that money left. Um, probably not that much, but I had to spend most of what I had left fighting the recall. Mm. So by the time the recall was over, of course, they didn't know it in California, but I, but I didn't, my money was pretty well out anyway. And I knew that it was going to run out because I wasn't practicing law. I did, I did, as I say, have some, some stipends uh, coming in, but I don't think I was at that point still doing the consulting work because it was limited work with the Field Foundation. Mm -hmm. So financially, uh, uh, the jig was going to be up anyway. <laughs> right. I, I couldn't have carried on with the same momentum and resources for a full four-year term. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it was really fortuitous I that see. they recalled me yeah. after two and a half years because I'd had a tough struggle mm -hmm. to carry on the kind of momentum. Mm -hmm. And so when they completed the recall, I had to decide, do I want to stay out here in the Bay Area and practice law? Right. Uh, do I want to go somewhere else? And that's when I made the decision to return to Memphis. Right. But even in, in that limited time, the two and a half years, you said you were, you were able to achieve some change. Did the change last? Did you stay in touch and see if, if 
if some of that change persisted in Berkeley? Uh, much of it did. Some, of it, For example, uh, we set the pattern of, of, of an integrated uh, city hall with uh, top-level staff people. That continued. Mm. Um, the same thing as opportunities in the police and fire departments. That continued. Uh, I took the lead in helping give the garbage workers um, increased benefits. What happened was that there was a strike and uh, we had in executive session told our negotiator to offer the union uh, more money for the lower paid workers who were the garbage workers, but that didn't get conveyed to the garbage workers in the negotiations. Mm -hmm. And so they went on strike, and so there was an impasse, and Kurt McLean, who was a un black union leader in the Bay Area, came to me and said, Diami, you need to take some leadership and call for a resumption of talks. And so I did. I, went, I said, I'm going to show up at the negotiating table. And I'm asking um, the union and the garbage workers to do the same, which they did. And we recommenced the negotiations. And um, two of the other council members joined me. Well, when we started again, we were getting nowhere fast. And I called the garbage workers, leaders aside, and I said, look, let's, let's go talk. Hmm. And I took them into a side room. And I said to them, look, I said, do you realize that we're offering you guys an accelerated increase versus these other guys? Because the only people that were on strike were the garbage workers, but the negotiations were for all of the municipal unions, uh, of uh, police, fire, and uh, engineers, and everybody else. And they were riding on the backs <laughs> of the yeah. garbage workers who were on strike. And I told those workers, look, if we go ahead and settle this thing, you'll get more money and because we were, gonna, we were trying to raise them to a level on a par with mm -hmm. these other city employees, which we did. And so that came because of that. Well, uh, because when we got the garbage workers, when I pulled their coattail and let them know what was happening, and they decided that they weren't going to carry these other unions, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Varichelli was the head of the union negotiating for all of them, but he, was, he had divided loyalties there. Mm -hmm. Tough union man. So anyway, uh, those kind of things were changes that we brought about. Um, now, what has changed since then that, that, that uh, uh, is the gentrification, mm -hmm. uh, that in those areas now where blacks lived in the, what we call the flatlands nearest to the river, mm -hmm. or to, uh, to, the, um, to the bay, mm -hmm. are now areas that are uh, largely uh, gentrified where mm -hmm. you have, instead of black, Families living in those areas now, you have a much greater proportion of, of upper income whites because the land is so expensive. And um, those blacks have sold out, many of them sold their property and moved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the black population of Berkeley has declined substantially from the 25% when I was there. Okay, yeah, interesting. You know, I wasn't okay. even retiring in Berkeley. There was no chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, you, you could, it'd be impossible to afford it. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, we're going to jump to Memphis. I wanted to ask. I wanted to. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about, um, especially since the anniversaries are happening or coming up, about the um, the Civil Rights Act and the and the Voting Rights Act, and where where were you at at the time of those? Um, pieces of national legislation and what your reaction was. Uh, give me the year because there was so much happening. 63 and 64. Okay. Um, uh, 64, um, I was still at Clark because I remember, um, let's see, President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 63 and it was in the wake of the assassination of President Kennedy that Lyndon Johnson took the leadership and gave great momentum to the thrust to mm -hmm. uh, pass that legislation. And I remember him uh, in 65 pushing for the Voting Rights Act, mm -hmm. and that was in the wake of Selma mm -hmm. and the killing of Viola Luzzo mm -hmm. uh, and Reverend James Reed. And I remember watching him on television when he was announcing his support for that and said, we shall overcome. And when I was sitting there watching this white Southern president in his Southern accent, mm -hmm. say we shall overcome, uh, but not just say it, but mean it in terms of putting the weight of the presidency behind getting this legislation passed in 65. Um, um, I knew that things had changed in America, and uh, I mean with, with Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, 
Kennedy had been um, the, in many ways viewed as the hero, but the real difference came uh, with the shoulder to the wheel work that Lyndon Johnson did after the assassination to get those get that legislation through the Congress, and uh, with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, um, I did not feel that the act itself was going to make a momentous hmm. change um, uh, because um, having seen in Memphis that blacks had to vote but still no money and no power, that uh, when all was said and done, give them the vote, uh, but what does that mean in terms of fundamental change? And I never really thought, and still don't think for that matter, that, uh, that voting power, political power, uh, is the be-all and end-all of the quest for liberation. It is a tool. Um, when I ran for the Berkeley City Council, um, it was not based upon my belief that uh, the system works. Now, the media treated it that way. They, they said, oh, the radicals have now gone within the system and they now believe in the system and they're going to make the system work. After our election in Berkeley, some young people ran in Madison, Wisconsin and were elected uh, on progressive platform. And others uh, of our generation began to mimic this whole notion that we in the Bay Area had developed. And a lot of that was through the strategy and the philosophies refined by the April Coalition, the hard work that they had done and set in the pace. We just helped to bring it about in a victorious way. Mm. Uh, but but I didn't, uh, to me it was opportunism as uh, as opposed to belief in the, the ongoing um, amenability of, of, of established political systems to make a mm -hmm. difference. So uh, I never looked, uh, the, the beating of heads in the street Mm -hmm. uh, and the going to jail, mm -hmm. those were the things that I knew made a difference mm -hmm. that would cause change in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, the riots in Watts and in Detroit and in Newark, uh, when people take to the streets and really confront those in authority uh, and bring things to halt, and that was my strategy in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you have to recognize that um, those strategies are not lasting. In other words, you've got to be prepared to move from one arena to the other because if you think that you can take one strategy and stand fast on that strategy and carry forth the progress, then you're in for a rude awakening because mm -hmm. you're going to be run over. Right. <laughs> and so you've got to know when, as the song says, know when to hold them and know when to fold them and, um, uh, because they'll, get, they'll eventually figure out how to neutralize yep. what you're doing. But in the meantime, you can make dramatic difference. But the system is not going to change because the political system is basically um, designed uh, to be used and controlled by the money power of mm -hmm. the country because it's money that ha you have to have to run for office and to stay in office. And then uh, the communities that you're trying to reach, you have to reach through mechanisms that are controlled by money, communications, um, and, and right on down to the workforce, and they've decimated unions, and so you don't have a, a labor voice that can kind of offset. And now in, for example, states like Tennessee, uh, where uh, politics means very little because we've got super majorities uh, hmm. in the legislature and a Republican president, and they are now, uh, they are balkanized in the country with strongholds of right-wing uh, power hmm. Um, and I'm not sure, but that in time, the growth of that power will not again become majority power in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why. Yeah, you know, this is what. This is what we're up against. But it's also, I mean, as you say, why a movement needs to be multifaceted. Yes. You need to have these fronts. You need to have the judicial front and the NAACP at the same time that you have SNCC and protesting sure. in the streets. And, sure. right. and, and I spent 19 years as a, as a, as a trial judge here in Memphis uh, and 14 additional years as a lawyer, during which I represented uh, 
uh, people who were charged with uh, uh, murder and were facing a death penalty. I've tried over a dozen capital cases where my client was facing the chair. Uh, and in those hmm. cases, I had to work within the system to hmm. uh, try to get justice for my client. Um, I, I was almost to say I had to thwart the system because um, lawyers within the judicial system are not looking for uh, justice, we look for victory for our side. Mm. And that's true if you're a plaintiff's lawyer or you're a defense lawyer or if you're rep representing the prosecution or the defense. Mm -hmm. um, when I was representing people facing the chair, um, justice may have been that uh, uh, if, if uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a believer in capital punishment, but it may have been uh, that many long years in the penitentiary. But if I got someone off with few or no years, mm -hmm. Uh, then to me that was a gratifying victory because that was my job, not mm -hmm. to have a just result. Uh, as a judge, however, for 19 years, my role was quite different. It was to uh, assure that the system at least was a level playing field for all sides within that arena. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never felt even then that, uh, that the legal system is a system set up um, for fundamental justice. It's a system by which you can order disputes mm -hmm. and set the rules by which to resolve disputes where people don't have to resort to violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe tweak it here and there to make it a little more just. But, yes, yeah. but then, you know, when you think about it, uh, and we look at the legal system, um, um, I remember Bill Kutzler and Arthur mm -hmm. Kanoi uh, who came to Memphis uh, when we were opening the Civil Rights Museum in 1991. And uh, those were two of the premier lawyers in the civil liberties and civil rights uh, struggle. And uh, at that time, uh, they were arguing uh, in their presentations to the groups there that uh, lawyers and activists should take their pleas now to state courts and state systems because the federal system was, and the federal courts were not responding. Hmm. Um, and so it was a matter of where do you fight? Do you fight on the state level or do you fight on the federal level? It's not that you have any great uh, affinity for either as, as it relates to change. Well, now the kind of advocacy that, uh, that, that, that may have been uh, developed to go into the state systems and fight there or even in the 1960s to go into the federal systems and fight. Mm -hmm. Well, now we can't go into the federal system and fight because you've got a Supreme Court with a majority that has no sympathy right. for the change that people uh, need and are fighting for. Mm -hmm. And, and the, while you do have some federal uh, appeals courts that are more sympathetic, uh, many of them are not. And, uh, and on, the fed, on the trial court level in the federal system, uh, you, you may or may not uh, get uh, a good conscientious judge. So right. uh, while in the hmm. past we could say that the judiciary is a means of change, but if you look at what's happening with them, uh, with the changes they're making on, on the um, Citizens United, where they're letting corporations now have complete ownership of the um, communications and, and electoral machinery that makes a difference in this country with unlimited money, mm -hmm. um, uh, then, then the judiciary is, is opening the way for that. The Bush, uh, Bush versus Gore decision, which was a uh, coup d'état, mm -hmm. uh, judicial coup d'état, mm -hmm. uh, against the will of the majority of the people. Mm -hmm. And then I saw Mr. Um, uh, Justice uh, Scalia say on television uh, within the last year or so, well, people need to just, quote, get over it. And, and so that's kind of uh, the judicial attitude. Yeah. So, Gutting the, the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so you just have to look at, uh, well, where do we turn to now? Mm -hmm. And um, um, in some ways, uh, we're just as uh, desperate. I mean, there are some of us who are better off. I mean, we've got a few more material things. We've got uh, educationally, we've, there's a decline in the number of African Americans, for example, that are uh, proportionally that get into the major colleges and universities. Uh, uh, um, the, when I was coming up, uh, we had at least the idealism that one generation would be a step better in its hard work and achievements than, the, mm -hmm. than, than our parents. Cool. But that's no longer the case. And so 
I, I tend to sometimes uh, re, uh, use the analogy of uh, Hegel's dialectic, mm -hmm. in which uh, there's the notion that uh, that there's a cycle, mm -hmm. and that things uh, calm down, and then in the calm, oppression wreaks its raises its mm -hmm. head again, mm -hmm. and injustice gets worse, and people then rebel, mm -hmm. and out of that rebellion you get progress and change, right, right, right. and there's a continuing cycle of the uh, thesis, things as they are, the antithesis, when people revolt, and the synthesis, some progress comes mm -hmm. and things get bad again. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, as it relates to the Voting Rights Act in, in 65, uh, as it relates to the Civil Rights Act, the Public Accommodations Act, uh, those things were uh, important changes and they were uh, important landmarks, but they never struck me as being uh, major game changers. Even when Title VII, uh, Fair Employment, uh, uh, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission and was passed in, in uh, 64 and became effective in 65, um, I was never so naive to think that we were truly going to see uh, the elimination of racism and employment opportunities in this country, and we don't see it even today. Mm -hmm. uh, the barriers are different. I mean, they're mm -hmm. not outright outright racial is in the same way, but, but the result is the same. Mm -hmm. You so got there, Could I ask the, the previous talk just a little bit on the side subject of this, which is the one great gain splash we made is in prison populations. Absolutely. I was thinking the same thing, yeah. As a person, can you speak to... It remo removes people from the ability yeah. to vote as well, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 I don't even know what the question is, but you know more about the different systems at work than I do. Could you give any any hope for reversing the situation? I think that the uh, that the explosion of uh, blacks in the penal institutions, um, the uh, is 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 part of the sense of of. Um, this country has destroyed systematically um, the sense of value and self-worth mm -hmm. among minorities. Mm -hmm. And we kid ourselves, and I think it's unfair for white America uh, to, uh, to think that uh, in the last 50 years, uh, say since the Brown case or 60 years, mm -hmm. uh, that, that suddenly uh, we can erase all of the ills and evil that arose from three centuries of, of uh, denial and, and exploitation and defeat. And as black families were destroyed and in, 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 in terms of broken up and not allowed to flourish, where black manhood was not allowed to, to be self-respecting, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the impact of that has been devastating on the psyche of black America. I was reading an article about um, the psychological impact of everyday racism that uh, works on black people because mm -hmm. even among whites who don't mean to be offensive, uh, uh, they create a tension in their mm -hmm. own interaction with blacks, whether it's on an elevator or in a department store or passing down a dock and street, mm -hmm. um, on up to who you prefer when you make a a job hire, mm. or, um, or or who you prefer among your associates, but uh, that creates an ongoing tension among black people that adds even uh, one study uh, at Columbia University to to our health problems. It mm -hmm. creates uh, uh, issues of blood pressure and mm -hmm. and, and uh, illness. My point is that that the pathology of blacks in prison. Is uh, is not just because you've got a lot of young black men who uh, are irresponsible, and they are. There are a lot of them that are irresponsible. That uh, leads to their, I mean, as the immediate cause of their incarceration mm -hmm. and attempted robbery or burglary or or what they call black on black crime, even. Mm -hmm. But if you look behind that as to why are they in this condition, mm -hmm. um, why do they have so little? sense of investment mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. uh, in life and in the society around them because they have not been exposed to the better things. Those things are alien to them. Mm -hmm. And you have to create an entirely new sense of cultural and personal awareness, which, in cause, which requires investment uh, into the human resources in these communities that this country is not prepared to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the, the refuse of our ills and of our uh, mistreatment of these centuries uh, is there that, that becomes the fuel that nourishes this continuing uh, nihilism mm -hmm. and this continuing walk in and out of prisons of our young people. Uh, and it's a justice system that becomes a, the gatekeeper that uh, revolves mm -hmm. them in and out. Mm -hmm. But the ones that come in with these pathologies leave with the same pathologies only to return. Right, right. And this just this expectation that they will be incarcerated, that's normal, and right. Got to because, break that cycle. Because, you know, yeah. if you look at uh, why are people, I mean, when I was growing up, um, there were cases of, of, of blacks who would uh, be violent toward each other, or fam but often that was family or friend violence. Hmm. Today you have a lot of this violence, uh, senseless violence that emanates from gangs, hmm. uh, or from the attempt to Im uh, imitate gangs. And what causes a young person in his or her teens uh, to associate with an organization that has so little respect uh, for another person's life or suffering? Um, or their own life, because uh, they surely know that there's a price to pay, but it's, it, it gives them a sense of bigness and of some sense of worth that they can identify with, with these criminal elements, these gangs. And, and, and the bigger, they, the, the more criminal they become at times, the bigger they feel within, right. their, within this Tiny world. <laughs> diseased yeah. infrastructure that they've become a part of. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Society wants to condemn them, looking at the end result, not recognizing its complicity sure. uh, in creating this monster that's out there and mm -hmm. that's continuing to grow. Mm -hmm. And it can be reversed, uh, but it takes not only resources, but it takes a different attitude. Mm -hmm. And white people have got to stop uh, being defensive and being in denial. You cannot eliminate generations of racism in 50 years. It's just, and, and people who say, well, I don't see color um, are, are just liars. I mean, you have to see color every day, and you may as well admit it, and then ask yourself, what does it mean when I see it in any given situation? And am I doing the positive in this situation as I see this color, mm. my color, mm. his color, her color? Or am I creating negative energies that are making the situation worse? But so long as you're in denial and, and are quick to take offense and say, oh, well, he's overly sensitive. Right. That right. was a great speech. That, that was, a, that was a great answer. And I mean, and, and it's interesting that the, the moment of the Obama election and the Obama presidency plays into this, right? Because there was a, a feeling of like, this as a band-aid or a panacea or, or however you want to describe it or that, that's when we heard so much of this, pardon me, but BS about beyond, mm. beyond race. And uh, my wife and I were uh, uh, in the Gulf on a cruise uh, the night of the election. We had voted early and I'm frankly glad that I was not uh, ashore uh, <laughs> where I would have to contend with, my, with the difficulty personally of knowing that in spite of all this exhilaration mm -hmm. that the next morning was going to bring the same challenges and the same battles as the morning before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I Or maybe even more because then, as you said, then you've got some people who are excusing themselves or patting themselves on the back, right? Absolutely. So the problem is, pretending the problem has been solved somehow. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's it. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay, we could keep going for hours. We need to talk about let's let's talk about the um, the, the civil rights center, and um, and then we'll we'll wrap up. 
Okay. And Cal, thank you for giving us so much of your oh, time. Sure. I'm and sorry to, to, to take Give me over one minute. like this. I have to check by. Yeah, of course. Um, of course. Let me. Okay. All right. So you return uh, to your um, to your hometown mm -hmm. in 1974. In 74. 74. Okay. And start practicing law here. Yes, yep. my brother was practicing here um, since '65, and so I shared office spaces, the space with him, and from '65 on, actually, until I was elected judge, and uh, from '74 rather until I was elected judge in 1990. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first got back to Memphis, I knew that people would be a little concerned that here's this crazy radical from California. So I. Um, in addition to practicing law, I wrote a weekly column in the morning paper each Monday, an op-ed piece. And that gave me, and I did that for seven years, and that gave me a chance to kind of level out the perception of me as opposed to letting people perceive me as being this wild-eyed California radical. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that, and that I thought was helpful. Um, and in uh, 83, I uh, ran for mayor because I felt that there was a need to introduce my kind of thought in the process. There were um, uh, two other black candidates and one white candidate in that race, major candidates. The mm -hmm. papers treated the four of us as major candidates. Okay. Uh, but um, for me, it was an opportunity to advocate. Uh, uh, the white candidate won. Um, mm -hmm. And that was likely to happen in any event uh, because of the strength that he brought into the race. And uh, at that point, we had not yet elected a black mayor in Memphis. Mm. But uh, that was a foray that I undertook in 83. I continued my law practice, uh, and then, as I said, was elected judge. Well, back in um, 82, uh, while I was practicing law, um, I ran into Mr. Walter Bailey, who was the black man that owned the Lorraine Motel. And Mr. Bailey had the first, had the same name as my father. They were both Walter L. Bailey's. And so when I grew up, people often thought it was my family that owned the Lorraine Motel, even though it was a different Walter Bailey. And um, so I saw Mr. Bailey. I was going into a little neighborhood convenience store to buy beer. And, Mr. and there was a laundromat next door to it, and Mr. Bailey had been in that laundromat to wash it, to do his laundry. And it was down here at uh, Vance and uh, uh, a few blocks from where the Lorraine Motel mm -hmm. is. And I really had never been that much involved with or thought much about the Lorraine. This would have been uh, when I first met Mr. Bailey. Uh, let's see, the foreclosure on the motel was in 1982. I met Mr. Bailey around... Uh, 1979, I think, mm -hmm. somewhere thereabouts. And he was struggling to try to keep the doors of the place open. His wife had had a, a stroke the night of the assassination, and she died uh, three days later. Okay. And uh, she had helped him to run the business. So Mr. Bailey continued to operate it. and So I introduced myself to him, and, and uh, this was, as I said, late 70s. Had it been a sort of a, a shrine of, of sorts? Did people come to visit it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 after the assassination, people were continuing to make pilgrimages mm -hmm. uh, to the Lorraine Motel, but it was basically a rundown mm -hmm. motel. I know that the Poor People's Campaign announced its start there uh, with Reverend Jackson and others. Yes. So it did have some resonance. But it, but it, as an establishment, it had really run down. Yes. yes. Well, it, it, uh, there were three buildings on the property, mm -hmm. uh, one of which was an older motel building that was closed, and, th and then there was a second hotel building which, which was attached to the office, and that was basically closed. And the only one of the three buildings that was largely functional as a motel was the L-shaped building where Dr. King was standing mm -hmm. on the balcony up. And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, much of the business there, or at least I'd say probably half of it, were prostitutes. Mm. Because after the assassination, that area of downtown was really uh, decaying or had decayed. And there were no businesses of any consequence in that area. Mm -hmm. And so it was a dark and seedy area. And there were prostitutes up and down the street and using the rooms of the Lorraine. And uh, uh, Mr. Bailey was trying to make ends meet as best he could. 
and um, um, he wanted to create. He had created a little bit of a shrine in the room that Dr. King at last occupied, where he kept the um, dishes that Dr. King last ate from, uh, which I now have actually, and he kept the uh, a library of his wife on display, and he kept. Um, uh, shoes of his wife that were in a display case next to the dishes. And uh, people would come and go into that room. And it was small, simple, but very hallowed. Mm -hmm. And um, um, the, it was open to the public and there was no charge. People would leave donations. Uh, but that was it as far as any kind of, of uh, shrine at the mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, he was trying to run the motel. And uh, I incorporated for him a nonprofit group, uh, the Lorraine King Shrine Foundation. Okay. And um, they were to then try to raise money to build a significant shrine there at the Lorraine. Um, he couldn't get any support. Mm -hmm. uh, there had been people from time to time who'd come in from out of town or maybe locally say, we're going to do this at the Lorraine and we're going to raise money. None of it panned out. Mm -hmm. And so he was trying to keep the doors open just with the business that he could get on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, in fact, I went with him one day um, as he took his mortgage payment out uh, to the mortgage holder's home. And Mr. Bailey and I went out there. Harry Sauer was the mortgage holder. And I remember Mr. Bailey <coughs> pulling out a little small brown paper bag that he had his cash in. And he counted out his payment to Mr. Sauer there, and they chatted for a bit. We left. Mm -hmm. But that was the level of business operation at that time. And so uh, when he couldn't get any traction, any interest in the Shrine Foundation, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I then did go to um, a, a local white businessman, Murray Ryder, who had a construction company. And that's R-E-I-T-E-R. And I said to Mr. Ryder, look, uh, come on down, let's look at the Lorraine, and uh, let's put together some money and buy it privately and develop it. And uh, he looked at it and brought some other partners down to look at it, and they said, we're not going to do it. So <clears throat> that was about all I could think of to do at that time. Mm -hmm. Again, this was nothing public because I uh, was not prone to any kind of public campaigns, mm -hmm. and I wasn't that vested in the issue for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so Mr. Bailey, uh, Mr. Sowery initiated foreclosure uh, on the place, and Mr. Bailey then had to file bankruptcy in order to stop the foreclosure, and that happened in uh, April, of the early spring of 1982. And Mr. Bailey got an order from the bankruptcy court to, uh, for, to stall the foreclosure, and when that happened, uh, the black-owned, not black-owned, but the black-oriented radio station, WDIA here, uh, launched a campaign to raise money to save the Lorraine. And uh, <coughs> Chuck Scruggs, who was the general manager there, uh, and two or three of his staff people were going to organize a major fundraising effort to buy the Lorraine from Mr. Bailey. Uh, and um, that's when they called me and asked me to join their effort. And I incorporated uh, the initial foundation, the Lorraine, uh, what well, we actually called it the Martin Luther King Memphis Memorial Foundation. And, um, but the effort of the radio station that was going to raise the money to buy the Lorraine directly from Mr. Bailey fell through. Uh, they were unable to raise any significant money. And so after two delays from the bankruptcy judge, he allowed the foreclosure to proceed. Mm -hmm. Now, we had done all that we could. I, by this time now, I am out publicly with the radio station and the people about raising money to save the Lorraine. And I really felt very bad because it was not my uh, approach on things to get out into a big public campaign without at least seeing a reasonable chance of success. But I was banking on the radio station being able to deliver, hmm. which they couldn't. And so the foreclosure went ahead. And uh, the sale was uh, on uh, December the 13th of 1982. And, out, and, and the mortgage was about $153,000, I believe. And um, <clears throat> Mr. Sowery's uh, son, Raymond, did the bidding at the courthouse on the day of the auction, which was at 12 noon. 
and uh, I bid for my nonprofit group. Well, I went to the auction, and I think I had about uh, $50,000 that we'd raised um, in our different radiothons and everything mm -hmm. we could do. So that was well short of what we needed to get close to the mortgage holder's mortgage, and he could bid up to that. Mm -hmm. And if no one matched it, uh, then he could walk away with the place. Uh, well, the union leadership had promised that they would give $25,000. They asked me union, and, and I was on pins and needles. And Jim Smith, who was the head of the union locally, showed up 30 minutes before the auction, and he had a check for $25,000. And so that put us at, um, uh, let's see, uh, we had the 25 from the union. We still were well short uh, of... We ended up with 140,000. Uh, so uh, I said we had 50. We must have had 65,000 going into the auction because the 25,000 from the union uh, put us at 90. Okay. And uh, uh, one of the leaders of my little small group, the Lower, uh, Martin Luther King Memphis Memorial Foundation, uh, was a black lawyer, A.W. Willis. Um, and he came to me on the steps of the court. I said, Look, Diabe. Uh, we can borrow $50,000 from Tri-State Bank. Well, that was the black-owned bank. And Jesse Turner was at the auction, who was the head of the bank, and was one of my group. So he said, well, I'll loan the money uh, if you get me two guarantors. And so I went to Jim Smith, the union. I said, Jim, I said, well, you all guaranteed 25000 He said he would. And then I went to Paul Shapiro, who, who had a cosmetics company, and I said to Paul, uh, Paul, will you guarantee 25, which he said he would. And so with their commitment there on the courthouse steps, we had another $50,000. This is all had, happening right before the auction. Just minutes before the auction. And so when the auction started, I had $140,000. And so as the bidding started, I was bidding. And initially, there were probably a half dozen or more people bidding. But by the time the bidding got to 100000 it dropped off to just being sour in me. And um, and I'd make a bid, usually in increments, say, of 5000 and he would increase it by five. And this went on until I got near to the 140 which I knew was all that I had. And um, when I finally did get, to, well, actually, I went over the 140 but I started dropping the bid down to $1,000 increments. And so he kept bidding over me, and I finally got to 144000 and I said, and not a penny more. And um, he didn't bid after that. <laughs> and so the hammer fell at $144,000. And, um, and so I got home that night, and I called um, Jack Belts, who's the owner of the Peabody Hotel here. And I had been able to call on him from time to time um, for small support, not financial, but if I needed a meeting place at the Peabody or something. So I told him I needed $4,000, and um, he raised that for me overnight. And so I had to appear at the um, uh, uh, auction company the next day with a cashier's check for $144,000, which we did. Hmm. And so we bought it. And um, so here I am. I'm practicing law. Chuck Scruggs is a radio station man. Jesse Turner is a bank man. So none of us were in this thing to build a motel or run a shrine. And so what do you do now? We own it. You own it. <laughs> and so we turned to Bailey and said to Mr. Bailey, look, you continue to run this place, uh, and you don't have to pay us any money. Um, whatever you make, you keep to pay for maintenance and whatever. you. Try to keep the prostitutes from being so aggressive. Uh, we knew that he wasn't going to stop it. I mean, couldn't stop it. Hmm. And so he continued to operate it from the time we bought it uh, in 82 until finally we got the project funded in 1986. Uh, uh, but we didn't start construction until 88 when they closed the Lorraine and uh, the construction actually began. Well, once we bought it, I got a letter from uh, Mrs. King's lawyer in Atlanta and uh, the lawyer said, uh, uh, if you don't drop Dr. King's name from the project, we're going to sue. And uh, so at that point, uh, I reported to the board and uh, recommended that we drop it, which they did. 
and we na renamed the foundation the uh, Lorraine Civil Rights Museum Foundation, which is the name of the organization now that currently runs the museum. And uh, but actually, it was a it was really a blessing in disguise that I'd gotten that letter from Mrs. King because I had not made any overtures to them, although I later was told that that. Chuck Scruggs at the radio station had apparently had some conversation with her before I got involved, which didn't go very well, hmm. and mm -hmm. that that might have created some difficulties. I don't know, because as I said, I didn't have any, until I got that letter, I'd had no contact with the Kings. But by getting that letter and by dropping Dr. King's name, <clears throat> it then freed me from having to be involved with having to go back and forth to the King family to discuss what we were doing or to get their approval on anything. So she made a couple of comments to the media that our project was morbid, uh, that we shouldn't be focusing on the place of, of death. Uh, and I didn't get into a debate with her about that. We just kept going. Um, now, here we are. We're owning the Lorraine. We've got no money. We, debt, we owe the bank 50000 So it was at this point that, I mean, none of the others really had much of an idea uh, what are we going to do with it? My idea was came from my involvement with the movement, and I knew that it was a place of tremendous magnetism that people would always come from around the world. And having been privileged to be a first-hand observer and participant in a very dynamic civil rights movement, uh, it was clear to me that the thing to do would be to wed the spirit and the strength of that movement and the story of that movement in the most dynamic way uh, to this site and to build a, an ex exhibition there that would make the visitor a part of the movement mm -hmm. because the movement by this time uh, was no longer. But I knew, I had seen how engaging the movement was to young people, how it would bring people in and get them motivated and convert them to warriors. And so I felt that we don't have a movement, but if we create one here, we can perhaps continue to churn out new activists. And so uh, uh, we sent out, I got some architects to volunteer their time uh, to help come up with some very rough plans. And with that, I got the, uh, I asked Belts to give me a room at the Peabody to bring in some government leaders, and they gave us $50,000. Uh, which we used to ask for uh, proposals from consultants. And we had a uh, half dozen different proposals that came in. And uh, among those was a proposal from Ben Lawless. And uh, we had a three-member committee, uh, myself, um, John Elkington, who was a white developer, and uh, A.W. Willis. And we looked at those proposals. And when I saw the proposal that Ben had, and Ben's proposal was largely the same exhibition design that is in the museum now. Now, it's being redone now, but uh, that's been the museum for the last 21 years. Mm -hmm. I saw that this was someone that had immediately captured the spirit and the energy that I wanted to see conveyed in that museum, the way he had laid out the exhibits to make them interactive, not so much interactive, but make them dynamic with voiceovers mm -hmm. and music and photographs to bring the life. Now, I told them that I wanted them to burn that bus and put it in there because I, I wanted people to have a feeling of being on the scene. I wanted them, even if they could, to smell the tear gas. Mm -hmm. And we had the sounds of barking dogs and what have you in, this, in the Birmingham exhibit. Um, and so with the design that Ben created, uh, because we then hired him on this basis of his proposal, gave him the $50,000, he came back with a much more detailed plan for the museum and a price tag of $8.8 .8 million. So I say to Ben, well, all right, Ben, how are we going to find $8.8 .8 million? He said, well, uh, get the state to give you half and get the city and county to give you half each, or a quarter, 25%. So I went to the uh, – Willis and I, and Scruggs, I, don't know, I think he was with us. I know Willis was. We met with the leader of the county government. He said no. We, the city government leader I couldn't even get a meeting with. <laughs> and so then um, – Willis had gotten a black in the legislature to have introduced a bill to give us $10 million, and it was just laying in the legislature that nothing had been done on it. But I knew that we were at a dead end, so I called a Republican that I knew locally because Alexander was a Republican governor. 
And I said, can you find out where the bill is? And he checked and he said, the bill is nowhere. It's just up there. So I called the legislature who introduced it. I said, Roscoe, I said, we need to get that bill moving. So then we, A.W. and I, and a staff person that had been assigned to work with us uh, from a government agency, went to Nashville and started lobbying the legislature. And we went from office to office and uh, talking with the legislature. And Ben Lawless came in from, from Washington. We met with the Speaker of the House, Speaker of the Senate. And we argued, we didn't argue with them, we made presentations about what we were trying to do. And so they saw it as a Martin Luther King project. And so uh, that, was, that was a positive for us at that mm -hmm. time. We had a mm -hmm. Demo Democratic-controlled legislature. And um, there, there were some people who were, had some misgivings uh, that they thought it would create uh, antagonisms and tension. Mm -hmm. And I would argue or say to them, no, this is just to inspire people. Mm -hmm. Although I was hoping that it would create these antagonisms and tension. That was the underlying idea. Mm -hmm. did, uh, they, did they see tourism dollars, too, or at that point, or not? No. No, that wasn't even mentioned. Okay. Uh, they saw it as something black people wanted, for, and it was a King project. Okay. Right. In fact, uh, uh, one, one day I went by one of the legislature's office as we were lobbying, and he said, Mr. Bailey, let me, if I can speak frankly with you, I'll tell you something. He said, we were talking, me and some other legislators here last night at dinner, and they said these black legislators, and most of the blacks in the legislature were from Memphis, mm -hmm. still are. We had uh, probably a dozen black legislators from Memphis, and the rest of the state combined only had two or three. And so he said, uh, these, these legislators, black legislators, want this money for your King project, but they also got their own projects that they want. You can't have everything now. If they tell us that this is their number one priority, you can get your money. So I saw these black legislators the next day. I said, fellas, let me tell you what a white man told me. He said, now, you all got these other projects, and I respect that, but you're going to have to put these on a back burner and let them know that this is the number one priority. And to their credit, they did. And when the black legislators let it be known to their white colleagues that they wanted this king money, at that point we were down to ask for $4.4 million, which would be half, mm -hmm. half of the $8.8 .8 we needed. And so... Uh, uh, with the black legislature solidly behind it, the Speaker of the Senate uh, was behind it, and the Speaker of the House was behind it, both Democrats. It passed uh, something like 83 to 17 in the House and 33 to nothing in the Senate. In fact, I was in the Senate gallery when it passed, and one of the uh, I asked to look at the agenda of one of the aides that was in the gallery where I was, and someone had written by that item for the Lorraine, this bill's going to pass anyway, so vote your conscience. And it passed 33 to nothing in the Senate. Hmm. So we left there with $4.4 million, came back to Memphis, and then gathered the local leaders and said, look, we got half the money. I brought in some legislators from Nashville. We need the other half from you. And so the county mayor balked, but, but he finally came on board, and we got the other $4 million locally. Then the question came up. We got $8.8 .8 million, and we were meeting in Nashville at this point, so raised from local business people? Or? No. 2.2 no. from the city government, 2.2 from the county government. Okay. And 4.4 from the state. Okay. No, we, we, we didn't get, the only money we got from local businesses was Paul Shapiro, who I put on the board, who gave us $10,000. 10, that okay. was it as far as local wow. business support. But everything else came from government. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so then A.W. Willis and I, well, A.W. was physically, was suffering from cancer, actually, but mm -hmm. so he ultimately had to stop working on the project. But up until that point, he was with me when we would go to Nashville on most of these trips. And, and he was with me when, we, when I was sitting at the table with representatives of the three governments in Nashville, and the question came up, well, we can't give all this money to this nonprofit group talking about our organization. We'd have to give it to a government entity. City of Memphis didn't want it. Of course, now this was a white mayor at the time. Uh, this would have been '86. County didn't want it. White leadership. So, I said, "Well, we'll give title to the state if the state will build the museum, because my organization still owned the property." And so, the state said, "Well, we'll take it." Now, the condition was that we'll give you the title if you'll build this museum according to the plans that we have here, which were the plans that Lawless had designed. So they agreed that they would do it. City and county agreed that they would send their 2.2 million each to the state. And uh, 
Thus it became and is the only state-owned museum in Memphis. Hmm. But the state took the title because sitting, I was kind of happy with that because I figured that that would limit political interference as we went along, local political interference. So we then, um, uh, once we got the money in place, um, as I said, it was about 86, then I had to meet, by this time, it was me alone because Willis was no longer able to keep going to Nashville. Mm. So I would then start meeting with the state architect. We had one bit of a flare-up because Lawless had recommended a white architect for the project here locally, and I was back in his demand, and I supported the one he wanted. Well, one of the black legislators said, no, said, I want my man, who was also mm. a white architect. Oh. <laughs> and, and so uh, with the standoff between the two of them, because at least our plan had had a collaboration with a black architectural firm in Nashville, the state said, well, we'll give the job to the black architectural firm in Nashville. So the black firm in Nashville got the job, McKissick and McKissick. But with the condition that I extracted from the state that they would put the state architect largely in charge of the project, because this was a major project that I wanted to make sure was going to be done right. So Mike Fitz, who was the state architect, actually took control of the project. And so we'd do all of our meetings and planning in his office in Nashville, where we proceeded to send out bids for contractors and designers and all of that. So everything was then being done with me traveling to Nashville, Lawless coming in from Washington, I to hold from Kansas City, the architects there in Nashville. Meanwhile, and you're still practicing. I'm still practicing. So you're, the, you're burning the, the candle. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and I got a board, which hadn't been coming to board meetings, but then as the project was becoming Suddenly, reality, yeah. they started coming to the meetings and wanting to know what's going on and where do we get input. And yeah. and basically I was filibustering them, uh, holding them at bay because I didn't want them to have input because we had designed this thing, we knew what we were going to do, we had the team that was doing it, and I didn't want to have to then deal with the politics of, well, should you have this person in the exhibit or this right. person in the exhibit right. or this theme or that thing. And so I would basically stonewall the board. Uh, and then they wanted to have new elections and bylaw changes because they were trying to figure out some way to get a handle on how to control this process that was moving and moving real fast. And my objective was to keep them out of it, let the people, the team that we were working with in Nashville. So at this, and so at that point, and this was as construction got underway and and was being built, mm -hmm. um, they were getting madder at me, some of them, on the board. I had some supporters. We had a board of probably 15 people, and I had maybe six or seven that were good, strong supporters. About four whites that were on the fence, but when they saw the tension, they saw an opportunity, at least one of them, a millionaire member of the board, uh, to step into a vacuum there and align himself with one of these factions, and he mm. ultimately aligned himself with the faction that was against me, because he knew that that I wouldn't allow him control of this organization, sure. um, whereas the others didn't have anything really to bring to the table to withstand his money and power, and that's Pitt Hyde, uh, who now chairs the executive committee of the museum and basically <laughs> controls the museum. Um, but, but what I would do is uh, the board meetings would sometimes break up in disarray. I mean, uh, rather than have them vote on things, that then it would create problems. Uh, uh, I would be involved in heated discussions and arguments with the board, and people would just get so frustrated and tired, and they'd throw up their hands and walk away. And then I could return to the calmer meetings in Nashville, uh, where we were continuing to put this project together. And so uh, my objective being, let me get this thing done and through before they get the control that, they, that they're that after. And so by the time it opened, uh, we had built this and built it right and right. built it, but they were, some of them, furious with me and were finally moving forward to get uh, bylaw changes in an election. And... Um, this is ben, the uh, better to ask forgiveness than permission uh, absolutely. approach. Absolutely. <laughs> and then Ben Hooks uh, was the one that, uh, he had been on the board uh, for, let's see, this, by this time it was 91 when we opened the museum. 
And he'd been on the board for probably at least five, six years, but had never been to a meeting. Hmm. But uh, uh, a couple of the people on the board who were close to him had talked to him in New York and gotten him to agree that he would serve as the president if they had enough votes to elect him as opposed to me. And um, um, when I was trying to strategize on how to forestall this, which was essentially going to be a losing effort, but I called Ben, who professed that he knew nothing about the plans underfoot. Hmm. And yet when I got to the board meeting, they had a letter from him saying that if they voted, if they voted him in, he'd take the job. And so by this time, the museum has been open for six months. It's open, yeah. And so um, they voted uh, in a nine to six vote to, to elect Ben as the president of the board. And they were going to, and, and they put the white be, uh, millionaire uh, chairman of the executive committee. And they were going to have me to serve on the executive committee. But I, res I had my letter, uh, statement of recognition resignation from the board already uh, prepared, which I read that night, and resigned from the board. Uh, because I, uh, by that time, uh, I was, I knew I had no strength to try to mm -hmm. have any, I mean, I'd have to start from scratch on any new agenda, because see, my idea was to move from the museum uh, to a place of action. That's why when I opened the museum, I brought in Bob Moses, Julian Bond, John Lewis, all of those activists from the movement, because my view was that I was going to uh, use those people and use that place as a center mm -hmm. for their energies and to build new energies to carry on further movement, which is not what it is now. Now it's basically a corporate, most of the boards controlled by corporate people who, I mean, some of them are black, but they still represent interests of corporations, and that's where the money now that fuels the museum comes from, it's no longer uh, uh, self-controlled. Mm. And you had said that you you originally wanted to call it the center rather yes, than a museum, National Civil Rights Center. Yeah. But I used the word museum in one of our meetings in Nashville. I told our group, uh, I said, let's let's change it to museum because. <clears throat> Uh, we still, I, periodically, I'd still have to go before the city council or the county commission for different approvals because at one point we had to get additional money. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to go before the state building commission in Nashville to get different uh, contracts approved. And so I, we were still in political waters. And, and I knew that there was still an uneasiness about where this thing was ultimately headed. And I thought that by calling it a museum, it would give it a more neutral appearance and create mm -hmm. less problems for us. But it wasn't my idea to really have a museum. Mm -hmm. it, it was my idea to, to have the movement uh, represented there in those exhibits as the beginning point for people to become re-energized uh, and create a new spirit of, of activism. And you feel that that hasn't happened? No. no. Not to, or not to the extent that you would have? It hadn't happened at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hyde, who now controls the board, uh, told me, well, Diami, if that's what you said, that's not what the museum's for. If you want to do that, you, you need to build your own museum. Hmm. Now, when we were down there today, we heard the plans described for the new building and that there would be that aspect to it, that at the end of all the exhibits, you would be sort of inspired as or asked, what are you going to do? Well, you can ask that, yes, but... Uh, that's not the same thing as having the planning going on there at the site and right. having the, I mean, how can you? Let's face it, um, the, the, the problems of America, the challenge of change, progressive change in America is still to tackle the corporations. Mm -hmm. Now, how are you going to have an institution that has now been taken over by the corporations, Federal Express, International Paper, AutoZone Corporation, which had been sued for major racial discrimination, which is one of the, and, and in fact, at the time that these discrimin this discrimination was going on, Hyde was the chairman of the corporation. Um, uh, First Tennessee Bank, I mean, these are the corporations that are sitting, seated at the table at the board. Um, mm -hmm. And so, corporation, I mean, it's not just the museum. I mean, this is happening, this has happened across the the entire movement. Mm. We talked earlier about the foundations. They didn't 
extract a pound of flesh from the, from the integrity of the movement. They stood to the side and, 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 were, and thrived on our independence. Mm -hmm. They didn't try to tell Chavez or King. Or, I mean, they may have, if, if asked, I mean, and they had their own ideas of things they wanted to fund, such as Les Dunbar wanting to see the Children's Defense Fund, but he was a big supporter of Marion Wright Edelman. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a whole different scenario now. The corporations are the ones that are doing the funding. And, and, and that's why the movement has basically been killed, not just at the museum, but the civil rights movement itself, the NAACP. Uh, when Bloomberg wanted to talk about uh, limits on fast foods, the NAACP says, wait a minute, we don't, we don't need any limits on, obesity is not a problem, and that's in essence what they said, because they're getting money from some of these fast food giants. Uh, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a monster. That's why when I said earlier, uh, and I'll say the same thing about the museum and about the civil rights organizations uh, that I said about politics, institutions are only useful to the extent that you can use them to make change. At some point, they become obsolete mm -hmm. in terms of your objective, and you have to create new forms to bring about change. Mm -hmm. Or not only obsolete, but obstacles. A absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a great sound bite. That was that was terrific. Should we end there, or should well we probably well, should right. end there because right. we've taken up hours of your time. Oh well, but it's it's been my privilege. It's it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.